Um, Harrison is wanting to dress up for the, seeing the Oppenheimer movie. He wants to know if he can borrow, like, if you have some sort of... Uh, oh, Ryan's all Oppenheimer all Oppenheimer-looking uh, hat. Thought that you probably, I basically, probably you dress not. like him pretty much, so... Friends, and welcome to the Autopod Decepticast, your bi weekly podcast that delivers an episode by episode breakdown of the original G1 series. This is our episode 208, covering 94 of the Transformers G1 series, The Return of Optimus Prime, Part 1. You should be sick all the time. It's I a- like this voice. <laughs> this is your host, Aaron, and I was going to open up with the true story of how Caleb, Ryan, and I met in the biblical times. Of course, I was going to be the beloved Messiah, Ryan, clearly Judas, and Caleb would have been, I don't know, John, who stayed with me to the very end, unlike those other poser-ass apostles leaving me to hang on a stake on the last motherfucking day of the work week. (laughs) Not a good Friday for me. Sorry. I I would prefer to be Pontius Pilate. We're all villains. (laughs) (laughs) So you're all working against me. Well, yeah. (sighs) Get that silver. Who are you guys? I am Caleb. I'm Ryan. But we have an extra special guest we'd like to welcome to the show. And that is James W., who is betrothed to the legendary Julia, a.k.a. Walnuts1 on the Discord. A little about James from our perspective. He is one of the elite APDC speedrunners. Uh, He's Mm. never been to Potter's Bar. He would never put paprika on potato salad, which, frankly, that's just a missed opportunity for him. For sure. He's got a perplexed look on his face. Uh, Collector of G1 Chug, Masterpiece, and Third Party, including a custom-painted Titans Return Triptychon. Have you still got that thing laying around? I do indeed. Up in the loft at the moment. Oh, Excellent. A Rodimus Prime militant, a Gundam groupie like me. Uh, I assume he is still waiting on the X Transbots Defensor. Will they ever release another character? I don't, I don't know. No. He is a thief of Groove. Maybe that's a story he'd like to tell at some point in time. And a general all round swell chap who's been offering us loads of kind support and encouragement. Welcome to the show, James Woo. W., a.k.a. Walnuts One. <laughs> Hello there. Th- thank you very, very much for having me on. Um, it really is uh, quite a, a genuine pleasure. Um, I've, I've listened to you for quite some time, and uh, it's, it's it's very interesting seeing the other side of it all. <laughs> seeing how the sausage is made, it's not pretty. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> the listener shouldn't know this, but we had some technical difficulties with my throat because, as you can tell, I sound a little different. I'm just I, I'm pretty sure it's allergies. A little husky. For the record, I've had two COVID tests this week, both negative. That's good. So if you get sick it, from me, it's not COVID, at least. No Rona. Okay, great. I, hopefully you've been thinking about this for weeks in preparation. Yeah. What would you like the listener to know that we didn't already cover about walnuts? That is a good question. Um, <laughs> yes, definitely I've been thinking about this for weeks, and I'm not just making it up on the fly. Um <laughs> Aside from what you've covered off, the the love of Transformers, which I drew at your podcast in the first place, I'm very boring. Um, <laughs> I... Well, let me, uh, if you don't mind, do you recall the Thief of Groove reference? Tell that story. No, I was, I was struggling to work out where that came from. I think you stole something, maybe? <gasps> uh, yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, now you say it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yes, yeah, so I know what that refers to. That does refer to the time when I was rather young. Uh, I think I was about eight. In advance of a equally young friend's birthday party, my parents bought him what his, his parents had asked him to buy, which was a G1 groove. Hid it somewhere, or they thought they hid it somewhere I couldn't get to it. They were wrong. Mm. They um, 
heard from Russell in the night and, and uh, came downstairs to find that I'd managed to climb up. I can't remember what I had to climb up, but it wasn't easy. It was worth it. <laughs> it was an adventure. And uh, was was transforming it in so much as a G1 toy actually requires transforming. Um, and run it up and down the kitchen. Um, and they there was no time. It was the next day of the party. So they just had to shove it back in the packaging, <laughs> tape it up, apologise. That was the last birthday party I got invited to. <laughs> it fell off a truck. Uh, I like the idea that they couldn't get into your head that this is for your friend for the party it's not yours don't open it but they had to hide it from you (laughs) or attempt to hide it from you i was a pain in the ass as a child (laughs) as your friends might attest (laughs) yes and my wife well not as a child but still now as a man child (laughs) yes Um, let me ask you this also. Are you still an advocate for Good Sam? Yes, I'm a big, big, big fan of Good Sam. Um, Do you want to tell us what I that think... is? Tell the audience what that is? So so Good Sam is um, uh, an app, or it's an organization that have a very, very good app. And what that does, if you have had sufficient first aid training, you're able to deliver CPR to a reasonable standard, um, and you've got some sort of accreditation that they, they approve of, they will send out an alert if you're within a certain radius of someone who is um, in cardiac arrest or who are, requires immediate medical attention. And sometimes, especially in, in London, given how, how big and busy it is, that you can get there before an ambulance does when it comes to any sort of emergency life support um, or emergency life saving sort of techniques. The sooner you can get them going, the, the better. I think there's something like... Uh, an eighty percent greater chance of survival if CPR is commenced within. A, so someone's going to get all these statistics up. I've got it all wrong, but it's something along the lines of eight like percent um, increased rate of survival if someone starts receiving CPR within uh, five minutes going to cardiac arrest. Sure, and then that, that is then improved by presence of a defibrillator. The other thing the app does is show you where the nearest one is. I, I think they're great. I've uh, I, I subscribe to it um, as a first aid trained person. I've, had, I've only ever had two in the last couple of years. I've only ever had, two, gosh, more, uh, more than that, I think, isn't it? Um, three or four years. I've only had two call outs. I've only had two times that I've been close enough to to have had the, the, the call, which is a very scary, like, submarine depth diving warning. And yeah. Um, yeah. without getting too much detail, one was more successful uh, than the other. But, um, but you were there. Still, the sheer fact that that exists uh, mm-hmm. is something of the way it's great. And it's something I know it's it's very much in the UK. And my understanding is that they are linked in um, and increasingly linking in with emergency services but in the UK and the US as well. Um, I th- and I think possibly Australia. Wow. So if uh, you're in these countries and you are CPR adequate, you just download <laughs> the app. And yeah. I don't. Yeah, you said meets a certain standard. I don't know. Yeah, it's okay, <laughs> everyone. Standard. It's okay. I am CPR adequate. <laughs> <laughs> but you log into the app, give your information, and then you get notifications when there yeah. is an emergency. And I guess how does the app know that there's an emergency? Is it dialed in? I guess to other emergency, public emergency services, and then it yeah. Just so so they're, they're tied in. Or, or my understanding is that they're tied in with the, the ambulance services locally, um, mm. and they just base it on your your location. Of you, you know, it's a little bit of like the, the whole privacy. You've got to let them know where you are. But for what it is, it, it seems seems worth it. And yeah, yeah, you do have to be CPI adequate, which is you have to provide a level of accreditation that mm. you have attained and show them proof of it. It's not just people running around going, "Oh, I fancy having a go at, at CPR." Right. Although still better than nothing right. to an extent. I've right. uh, uh, I'm a I I'm an RV camper guy, and I've been to a few campgrounds, and I've seen those uh, Good Sam stickers uh, around some campgrounds. So oh, it's, really, it's around. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Are any of you CPR certified at this table? I am not. I, I'm not either. I'm not. I'm shame on me. <laughs> nobody's hurt. nobody's holding your feet to the fire. <laughs> okay. <Caleb>. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. We're so all, we're all fucked if we yeah. have a problem in this basement right, right now. <laughs> Maybe if something happens during this recording session, James can He's instruct get one on a of plane. you guys. No, <laughs> I'm saying get, like he can instruct you. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Keep me alive. 
and uh, I'm on, I'm on statins. It's most likely going to be me. <laughs> I know the general idea of uh, chest compressions. You do it to the the beat uh, per minute of the song "Staying Alive." Really, you do yes. Fascinating. Which has the same beat per as minute another one bites the dust. As, right, exactly. <laughs> Take your pick, whatever works. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. That's uh, that sounds like an awesome service, and I guess to the extent that it's here, I hope that it yeah. spreads or other services well, like that emerge. And that's why this episode is sponsored today. Yeah. What? Uh, no. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Uh, not that we've represented them very well. Uh, well, James has. We're all like, I don't know CPR. Oh. <laughs> we've talked back and forth in the past. We, you and I are both masterpiece collectors. And I know the listener would love more toy conversations coming yeah. out of this uh, podcast. And at one point in time, we discussed a top 10 masterpiece company list. I don't know. For the purpose, of, I'm sure your list might – these things probably update over time. But what would you say is your top five right now? That's a hard and, question. And what's a figure that is indicative of that company's quality? Right. Okay. That, that's a very good question because, unfortunately, you'll get some things that are aesthetically fantastic – but the QC is questionable, or the the transformation is overly complex. I think I think you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. Um, so I think at the top, I'd still be looking at. Although they don't, the problem is, a lot of those companies don't exist under the same names as me or uh, anywhere sure. either. Um, so you've got whatever um, DS. Oh, was it DS? No, it, 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 the, the ones that made the DS. So one star screen, right? Um, whose name escapes me at the moment. They also known as Transform Element at different points. Uh, yes. They have another one when they put out that Blitzwing. Star Toys. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, Star Toys. So because why, right behind me, actually. <laughs> right. um, and that is superb. That is a fantastic piece. Definitely better than the other offerings that, that have uh, come out in the past. It's, Are you talking oh, about the Blitzwing? Yeah, the Blitzwing yeah, yeah, is yeah. superb. Very really good. It's good. Um, and I think that that seems to be the quote that although they're not, they don't mass produce in the way that some like X Transports um, or, uh, well, I'll say mass produce, I mean repaint, that, that so X Transports does or, or um, uh, trying to think of another good example. Everything's changed a lot over the last couple of years with the, the three, the third party. Um, but what they put out is superb. Their Mirage was great. Their Optimus was, is my personal favorite of the sort of the modern Optimus Wars. Blitzwing. Mm -hmm. um all, all superb star screen absolutely great um so yeah that'd be still be sitting at my top top spot i agree oh. uh i'll I, I think they're a great company i think ryan the reason they change up their branding i think they got into maybe some legal problems that makes sense but and maybe mm -hmm. with takara even their star screen was definitely not a knockoff of the yeah. takara star screen although i mean aesthetically they do look very similar but the mm. engineering is completely different that's what i understand about them but i wish they would do more they're they are a contender for sure hmm. yeah and um, I, I think it probably didn't help them drop in that their star scream at almost exactly the same right. time the official one came out. I think that's right. yeah, it's gonna be where. Although all the Optimus Primes came out right around the time yeah. Masterpiece Optimus Prime came out, there was some ballsy moves happening yeah. Yeah, around the Prime days. I <laughs> really, really were. I will need. Um, to, I need to make a quick correction. Uh oh. So the good Sam that I'm seeing <laughs> okay. around here is that the sandwich place? Is it is for RV and camping? is a separate Good Sam oh. from what he's talking about. Well, the weird thing is is the logo The logo for the Good Sam I'm aware of is a guy with a halo above his head. So you would think like, oh, he's like a guardian angel. Right. You, I just, what is it? It's it's just a, it's a company that sells RV and camping stuff, and there's it's like an a RV network. So don't, don't call don't. them if you're <laughs> having a problem. Uh, and on the flip side of that, if you're looking to get some assistance with your recreational vehicle, don't call the Good Sam first right. responders. Responders, right. just trying to. Sorry, just had to Maybe put that out RV there. needs a jump start. Uh, well, you know, hmm, interesting correlation there. <laughs> All, right, well. <laughs> All right, let's let's do top three. Number two, who's coming top yeah, right? That's probably easier, isn't it? Um, <laughs> number two, I'm going to have to go as much as. This might be a little bit controversial. I'm going to have to go X-Transport slash KFC. Whew. All right. 
<laughs> purely because I like the aesthetic of what they put out. I hate some of their recent transformations, but some of the older stuff I really, really liked. The aesthetic's good, and the pricing is much more reasonable than the fans' hobby. Um, although I do have issues with their, their queue. So I literally have sat here in front of me a headless um, Snapdragon from God's I've got my screen wide. I don't know what that is. Isn't Snapdragon a headmaster? So he He's meant be. to be. <laughs> Did you break um, the head off the headmaster? So that's what remains of him. Um, because out of the box, the head, the connection port that attaches to the, the body of it fell off. It just snapped straight off um, and required drilling out to, to get the piece out that was stuck inside. And the reason that's out, I'm literally had a, a new part turn up today that I'm going to be fitting. And even the new part, too tight, going to have to fold it down. So x box. I do like what they put out, but... QC and transformation is always yeah, uh, problematic. Yeah. And they do make beautiful figures, though. And they've been painting them more. In their early days, they were yeah. shy with the paint. Now they, they get that brush out or the spray or however you do that. I don't know. What am I, a fucking Make operations manager? Or some weird... <laughs> and then I think third up, this is MPL, isn't it? So it's going to have to be fans hobby. Because I mm-hmm. love what they make. It's just the transformation is trying to transform their blur or their cup. It's frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating. Oh, and you said fans hobby, trying... but I think you meant fans toys, right? Sorry, fans toys. I meant yeah, that's okay. uh, fans hobby would be my other one. If this wasn't MP only, because they, they stray away a bit from the aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Um, I think fans hobby are great, but they don't make masterpiece. They make masterpiece adjacent. I would say they make masterpiece. They, I think they're scaled at that. I'll give, if you want to say fans hobby is your number three, I'll allow it. Oh, I'll, I'll definitely go. If fans hobby, I think I'd probably put number two then. Um, oh, but shoot. Because the QC is great. Their, um, their, the products are great. I think they have some issues with uh, the Amada Prime they put out. But apart from that, and they, then they rectified it. I really, really like them. Um, I, th- I think they're, they're, they're not just good representations of the characters they're meant to be. They're also quite fun. They're, they're, they're designed, maybe not to be played with, but to be transformed, picked right. up, messed they're about sturdy. with, put down. Yeah, unlike fans hobby, and I'm someone that I broke my Tonka toys when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So if, if if it can stand up to me, it's probably doing pretty well. But whereas fans hobby, uh, sorry, fans toys, you have to be so careful with every every yeah. transformation, every movement. Things just fall off. I don't transform um, my fans toys. It's like they cost yeah. too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But luckily, they usually show up in robot mode, so I don't have to transform them. I can just put them on the shelf. So I, always, I have to do it once, just so I know I've done it. And then right. after I've done that, robot mode, put them to one side. I don't have two hours to spend transforming <laughs> a toy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but no, Fans Hobby is great. And I would also shout out their customer service, because I did manage... I have their monster bots, and I did manage to break a wing off of one of them. And they were super easy to work with and sent a new piece. And it was a couple of years after I bought it. They didn't charge me wow. for it or anything. They were just very generous and easy to work with. So the one thing I would say about Fans Hobby, though, is uh, they could stand to put some paint on those things. Yeah. But maybe that's part of their sturdiness. Maybe that's part of the playability is by not doing that. They put an interesting little tampo decos usually on. They're like really de- I don't know exactly the process behind it but it almost looks like it's printed onto the plastic and it's usually really detailed and high quality but i just want more of that i want Mm -hmm. more on the you know on the big fleshy parts of the of the bot as well but no they're great i just got their double dealer as well and i need to reach out to them because the eagle head or whatever that bird is vulture head is missing an eyeball (laughs) but (laughs) that's quite common apparently i've heard a few people say that did you, did you go with the purple wings or the green ones? I went with the purple, the second-ish. Yeah. I just like the color. I don't know enough about the character to know which color scheme is accurate, but I just liked that color scheme. Do you know which one's accurate? I'm hazy on my uh, Japanese I know like very little about Headmasters. Um, I can't wait till you cover it, because I'm sure you will oh. at some point. And it's going to huh. be very entertaining. Oh. Wow. That'll keep this show going for another 10 years. <laughs> yes. I- I've tried watching it several times, and no matter what dub I try and watch it with, I'll just give up because the dubs are terrible. So uh, a show that you give up on just watching casually, we're expected now. I remember to- somebody, a lot of people are excited about Beast Wars, but at least one person whom I forget said that they want us to cover it because they don't want to watch it. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, that's and, fine. And now we've got that with the Japanese series as well. 
So I will say you're pretty consistent here looking at your old list. Um, you said Transform Element last time. You said X Transbots was your number two and Fans Hobby was your number three. You put Fans yeah. Toys down at number seven. And all the things you said about Fans Toys are, I believe, legitimate gripes. But I still feel like overall they make the most beautiful figures, which for me is probably my the attribute that I care about the most, which is why I end up paying for those stupid fucking things. <laughs> which is fair. And they are beautiful, but it's uh, still a pain if you want the Fans Toys Menasaur. Yeah, well, supposedly, I mean, I don't know. They put more mm. images out. At least if that last card, I'm because I'm not putting them in their Minasaur mode. I'm using them for bot mode. So if that last car comes out, I'll be happy. I'll, I might buy yeah. the body just to have it in case. But I have the X Trans bots in Minasaur mode, and it's ugly. And but you know, it's there. <laughs> I'm happy enough with it. <laughs> Do you have any of the combiners like the X Trans bots combiner? So I've got the X-Transports combiner. I've also got, um, not X-Transports, but the, ah, the Superion, and I can't remember who made it. It's Are you really thinking good. of Zeta Toys? Zeta Toys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zeta Toys, their Superion, and their Brutus, the two inaccurate one. And yeah. those are fantastic. Actually, Zeta Toys should be on my list as well, because they're fantastic. Yeah, they um, put them in the fan hobby realm. They're solid, yeah. not painted that well, although they do have painted editions they put out afterwards. Um but just, they're playable. You're not going to break yeah. them generally. And they look great in that combined mode. And they kind of, they along, I think, what was the name of the company they spun off from that did the Devastator? TSC? Toy World. Toy World, that's it, yeah. Yeah, they invent, I mean, you have to give them credit for inventing the modern combiner and yeah. creating something that's stable, poseable, gigantic, and looks fantastic. Yeah. Very much so. All right. That's Toy Talk, everybody. I hope you Good. liked it. Good. Everybody's begging for toys. Well, it's what as, it's all about. I see, keep hearing. As you can see, we can talk the talk. <laughs> That's right. Or Aaron can talk the talk. <laughs> We're not posers. <laughs> no. I'm just over here getting good Sam's confused, but uh, you know, he, we, we each have our attributes. I'm wondering if you're even really a true camper since you didn't know about good Sam's. Uh, from the brand that you see out in the world like <laughs> right. maybe like a runner who didn't well, know who, what nike was you know <laughs> give me a break man <laughs> caleb doesn't know the outdoors i've got to go now and like now now when i see a good sam sticker i'll be like yeah i know what that is i'll be like, all insecure <laughs> about it right you'll high five them so return of optimus prime part one what is it about this particular episode that made you uh want to hop on and chat about it um so this is uh, something that i have on and off watched for years in the sense of growing up my parents needed to keep me quiet and stop me from opening random presents <laughs> so on vhs i had the return of optimus prime parts one and two um which was one of the few videotapes that wasn't taped off the tv that was hanging around the house and every time they need to keep me quiet they'd shut that in and sit mm. down in front of it. Um, it's a great episode. Some of the animations might be questionable. There are a couple of little plot holes, but obviously we'll talk about that in a bit. But um, the overall... I mean, it's not just the fact they bring back Optimus Prime, obviously. Um, probably no spoilers there, given the name of the episode. <laughs> but um, it's the whole thing. It's Rodimus and Optimus together-ish, sort of. Um, it's the way the plot... I don't know, sort of flows. I, I, th I think it's, it's one of the, the strongest episodes or, or two-part episodes of, of the series. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Also, the fact it's got the touch again in it, which is such a great song, although not in this bit, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, is it, it's just that 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 is just one of those moments where they they played that perfectly. It could have gone so many different ways, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Really like this episode. I, I think the two parter is a this two parter is a great way to end the G or G one season three. Like it's a good ending for the season. It's good closure. I mean, it might be the best episodes of the season. I like, yeah, overall, they're, well, like, I still animation quality. Dweller story in the life. Depths is still my favorite, but these are close. Yeah, I have a Return of Optimus Prime memory that I'll share. Uh, I also had it on VHS as a kid, so I'm very and I. I've probably seen it as much as I'd seen the movie uh, up to that point. I've probably seen the movie. I feel more like now. they also ran these two a lot. 
because I remember yeah. watching them a lot, and I yeah. did not have them on VHS. But yeah, it was a prized possession of mine, and I remember in uh, my memory is fourth grade. I cannot remember my fourth grade teacher's name. Do you remember your fourth grade teacher's name? Mrs. Cuthbert. Do you remember my fourth grade teacher's name? Was it Mrs. Murphy? Murphy, I, that's I, it. I had Tegler. Ugh. Yeah. Tegler the tyrant. <laughs> <laughs> they called her. Shots fired. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Murphy's class and Mrs. Cuthbert's class would frequently gang up to put on movies and stuff. I don't know if both teachers just had a, a good like the same hangovers. The, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they're having white wine together yeah. the night before they're like tomorrow's a movie day right <laughs> wink <laughs> and uh so i at some point said i really would love to share this with uh the class next time we did a movie day and i brought in return of optimus prime part one go. and two and it was it and yeah we went to your class to watch it so that meant we were all on the floor and the the, you know, they turned the lights off and the room went dark and they put it on and there was this girl. We can oh, choose, yeah. choose to edit her name or not, but her name was Carrie. Mm-hmm. And I heard she goes, tweet, or she probably was like, tweet, tweet, tweet. And I turn around and she goes, you're a fucking dork. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh I, I remember at the time I was like, "What? I don't even know you, you first of all." And uh, but you know, I was a little embarrassed. But I was trying to make up. I was like, "No, this is awesome." But that girl, just as a side note, was a bitch to me throughout like my entire life. Like, she, I, it's the rest of the she K-12 never recovered. Career, she was a total bitch. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll be bleeping that. Fuck, name. So fuck you, Carrie. And I hope your life is terrible now. And this is a big weight off my shoulders. Oh, okay. And you've, you're finally out of my head. I'm glad you're confronting this. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Caleb. Yes. Is this an appropriate time? By the way, I haven't thanked you. Thank you again, James, for being on the yeah. on the program. Is this a good time for trivia? We can do it. There's, it's always a good time for trivia. Okay. I as as I'm sure everyone has witnessed, I do trivia, and sometimes a re- a lot of ex- exposition up front, and this one is going to uh, achieve that. So let's uh, dive right into it. How many questions do we have here? Uh, five. Okay. I usually try to keep it to five. Let's get going on. I I know you guys. I know how you guys like me to pick uh like quirky names for it. So I I kind of stumbled around and I settled on Quiz Erection. Excellent. <laughs> So uh, this is, you know, a resurrection theme. Oh, I thought it was an erection themed quiz. Uh, that will, well, <laughs> <laughs> something to think about. All right. Yeah. <laughs> for uh, the so for uh, quiz erection trivia, Optimus Prime can't stay dead. Why? Why is character death and resurrection so prevalent in storytelling? Discussing this topic could be an entire podcast series in and of itself. So I don't want to unpack it too much, but I need a bit of setup here. In fiction, one reason for a resurrection is the human ability to empathize. We can feel the pain of other people when they are sad or angry. These emotions are what make stories epic and enjoyable. Without heartbreak, tragedy, and obstacles, much of the anticipatory excitement of the experience is gone. The emotional journey books and movies bring us on allow us to immerse ourselves in another world, and we inevitably get emotionally invested. Additionally... Through their actions, we can experience overcoming or undermining the greatest odds to save or ruin the day, (laughs) including one of the oldest and most pondered characteristics of humanity, mortality. So, let's explore through trivia some selected topics where people have attempted to either cope with or overcome mortality via exploring resurrection. Okay. So, getting into the first question here, set up for the first question. Death fascinates humans and probably always has. The oldest extant epic, that of Gilgamesh, directly addresses the question of why death exists. Obviously, Jesus wasn't the only one believed to have risen from the dead. Stories of resurrection appear in ancient cultures around the world. Let's pick one. (laughs) In Finnish mythology, Lemekainen is a hero who sets out on a mission to capture one of the black swans from the river of the underworld. He dies in the attempt, and his body sinks in the waters and is lost. The body is broken on the rocks at the bottom, and his remains are scattered. Lemminkainen, his mother, comes in in search of him and gathers together all of the body parts, sewing them together. This does not return her son to life. (laughs) So she does what to finish 
<laughs> the job. Is it A, she sends a bee to fetch some of the god's honey? Is it B, sends a wolf to fetch some of the god's livestock? C, sends a dove to fetch some of the god's grain? Or D, does what all of you pervs are thinking right now? <laughs> And I think uh, I go. I'm going to go in uh, clockwise here. And so, James, you are to my uh, immediate left. So, what do you think? A, B, C, or D? Uh, I'm going to go A. Okay, Ryan. I also went with A. And Aaron. God's honey sounds good to me. You guys are all correct. <laughs> oh. She entreats a bee to ascend to the halls of the overgod Uko and fetch some from there a drop of honey as ointment that would bring Lemminkainen back to life. Only with such a potent remedy is the hero finally restored. Lemonkainen is my favorite Snapple flavor. Good, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. Uh, on the two. In the world of daytime soap operas, characters fall in love, break up, and endure incredible drama, woes, and at times, happiness. Soap fans can find the death of favorite characters heartbreaking only to have that same character reemerge months, years, or decades later. It is not unusual for a character to pass away and then miraculously come back to life. And many soap opera characters are infamous for having nine lives. What is the record, as far as my research could hmm. find, for a soap character dying and coming back to life? Hmm. Is it A, four times? Holy God. B, seven times? <laughs> C, 13 times or D 21 times. Oh man, okay. James. Do they have soap down... operas soap operas in uh, oh, yes. the UK? Yes. Uh they do. I'll try and avoid them. Okay, yeah. Um <laughs> when in doubt go see. Okay, Here's Ryan. Rule here. I went with B uh 7. Okay, Aaron. I also went C 13. Okay. Days of our lives character Stefano Demera introduced in 1982 as and nicknamed the phoenix by viewers has quote <laughs> died 13 times Ooh. so those of you that picked c were correct he's come back stronger than ever each time being because of this he holds the record in the town of fict fictional days of our lives town of salem for the most faked deaths Portrayed by actor Joseph Mascolo, the character of Stefano was resurrected one way or another after being shot, crushed under rubble, and suffering from two separate inoperable brain tumors, <laughs> to name a few. The go-to soap opera. Yeah. I remember him when my mom watched, uh, watched him. In I remember game. him. Yeah, Stefano was a big Same deal. guy plays him to this day. Sadly... Mascolo died in 2016 at the age of 87 after a long battle with Alzheimer's. Or did he? Or did he? Dang it, you no, took my sorry. line. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I was going to go, or did he? <laughs> but I didn't see really, whatever. I fucked Regardless, up. the character of Stefano lives on. For in 2022, his essence was inserted into character Steve Farms oh via a microchip. <laughs> Stefano lives again to die another day. <laughs> I thought you were going to say they used AI to like digitally insert him uh, by the by the rules that the Hollywood studios are going for. That they'll yeah. probably get that. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. On to question three. Mm -hmm. Fiction aside, some people have attempted to cheat death by participating in cryonics. Ah. Cryonics is the low temperature freezing, usually at negative one ninety six Celsius or negative three twenty Fahrenheit, and storage of human remains, with the speculative hope that resurrection may be possible in the future. Cryonics is regarded with skeptic skepticism within the mainstream scientific community. It is generally viewed as a pseudoscience, and its practice has been characterized as quackery. <laughs> the first corpse to be frozen was that of James Bedford in 1967. As of 2014, this outdated source <laughs> states that about 250 bodies have been cryopreserved in the United States, and 1,500 people have made arrangements for cryopreservation of their corpses. Mm. One particular well-known figure spent years telling scientists about his dream to have his brain and penis cryogenically what? frozen and brought back to life at a future time and place in order to seed the human race with his DNA. Ugh. Who was it? This is not a multiple-choice question. 
You must guess. Okay. Oh my god. You guys can think about that for a bit. It brain and seed. Brain and penis. And penis. Frozen. But what about the to... balls? Yeah. He well, needs let's his just, Let's consider the entire the genitalia. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll consider it for Not a moment. just the shaft. While you're thinking That'd about it, there is fun. an excellent Star Trek The Next Generation episode that, that this plays into with cryonics. Cool. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, James, are you ready to wager a guess? Oh. Uh, I'm torn between two names. Who um, you can you can rank equally on my. We, we will Oscar allow you. To, we will allow you to say them both. That's very kind of you. I've gone with L. Ron Hubbard uh-huh. and Kanye West. Okay, <laughs> Ryan, Elon Musk, Aaron. I, I'm sure this isn't right. I'm just going to say Donald Trump. Okay, those are all kind of in the realm of this. Actually, one way. Or, I mean, those are good guesses, but. Uh, the correct answer is Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. Oh, God. Epstein divulged on more than one occasion that his goal was to impregnate 20 women at a time who were by his standard attractive and possessing, quote, impressive academic credentials, unquote. He based this idea for a, quote, baby ranch, unquote, uh. on accounts of the Repository for Germinal Choice, which was to be stocked with the sperm of Nobel laureates who wanted to strengthen the human gene pool. Uh, so eugenics. he said that on more than one, uh, more one occasion, and uh, of course at over dinner conversations, and you know, of course, no red flags there. <laughs> I should have guessed that because he gave Harvard millions of dollars to like just these crazy studies yeah, to, yeah. to extend his life. Yep, yep. So that's a fun idea to think about. Hey, let's <laughs> let's let's talk about zombies. Cool. Okay, moving on to four. A zombie, and this is all obviously obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. A zombie is a mythological undead corporeal revenant created through the reanimation of a corpse. The flip side of the appeal of heroic or miraculous resurrection, the notion of zombies explores the fears and anxieties resulting from tampering with immortality, the unknown, or humanity in general. In fiction, zombies are most commonly found in horror and fantasy genre works. The term comes from Haitian folklore in which a zombie is a dead body reanimated through various methods, most commonly magical practices and religions religions like voodoo. Modern media depictions of the reanimation of the dead often do not involve magic, but rather science fiction methods such as carriers, fungi, radiation, mental diseases, vectors, pathogens, parasites, and scientific accidents. Simon Pegg, who starred in and co-wrote the 2004 zombie comedy film Shaun of the Dead, wrote that zombies were the, quote, most potent metaphorical monster, unquote. In that movie... What does Sean's friend Ed's shirt that is worn throughout the whole movie say? Is it A, honk if you're horny, B, I got wood, C, what me worry, or D, Winchester's pub? Can you wager a guess? Uh, I'm going B. I love this film. I think it's B, but I'm not 100% sure. Ryan. Yeah, I went with B. I believe it is. uh, I love this movie as well. Aaron, I I'm almost certain it's B. You are all correct. Worn by actor Nick Frost, it says I got wood. This light brown shirt features the words I got wood and has some <laughs> nice trees in the background. Buy yours today. He was uh uh what's the name of that director? Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg was also in those Star Trek movies, Ryan. I'm surprised you didn't bring that up. I don't like those movies. Well, I mean Seems like I'm not, you, I'm you not, like an oddball Star Trek. I'm not keen on the Kelvin universe. Uh, question five. So well, what is the future of resurrection technologically? Ray Kurzweil, American inventor and including some really cool synthesizers uh, and a futurist, believes that when, this, when his concept of technological singularity comes to pass, it will be possible to resurrect the dead by dis- digital recreation. Such is one approach in the concept of digital immortality, which could be described as resurrecting deceased as, quote, digital ghosts, unquote, or digital avatars. Related alternative approaches of digital immortality include gradually replacing neurons in the brain with advanced medical technology, such as nanobiotechnology, as a form of mind uploading. Another example Physicist Frank J. Tipler, an expert on the general theory of relativity, presented his 
Omega Point Theory, which outlines how a resurrection of the dead could take place at the end of the cosmos. He posits that humans will all evolve into robots, which will then turn the entire cosmos into a supercomputer, which then will, shortly before the big crunch, perform the resurrection within its cyberspace, reconstructing formerly dead humans from information captured by the supercomputer from the past light cone of the cosmos as avatars within its metaverse. Weird. (laughs) So to conclude with a final question, if you were given the choice of immortality, would you take it and why? I'll choose the winning answer based on my own hubris. All right. So, James, if you were given the choice of immortality, would you take it and why? No wrong answers. No. Just one that I favor the most that I'm going to choose as the winner. I'm going to say no on the basis that in many extents, I think it would render life, the sensation of life, meaningless. Mm. It's kind of hard to express, but when you've got an unlimited amount of time to do whatever you want, mm-hmm. you, you're not going to enjoy the moment you're you're actually experiencing. Very good. Ryan? Um, I'm going to say... Ooh, mine's a complicated answer because it's probably no. Let's hear it. But may I would here's what I would say. Yeah, I'll give it a shot if I'm a be able to self terminate at any point. Just to check it out. I think that would be a precondition for me as well. Aaron, uh, I like that precondition. I say yes because at this point in time, I I fear death to uh, I have nightmares about it. But I also feel like. There's so, so much infinite things to learn. I feel like you could. True. I feel like you could live infinitely and be entertained and perhaps enjoy life. I do understand James' point of does it does it take something away from life if if it doesn't mm-hmm. end? Uh, but I feel like that you could endlessly, you know, improve yourself and maybe the world eventually once you become mm. fully self actualized, mm. Caleb. Um, I will say yes with Ryan's precondition. Uh, mine is very curiosity based. I I just want to see kind sure. of how things uh, uh, develop. Um, as far as I think these are all great answers. I will choose James's answer as the winner just because uh, he's the guest today on the show, <laughs> and I'm trying to suck up to him. So uh, James, you get the point. Uh, oh, thank you. All right, I think that makes him the winner. So I. Uh, James has a perfect score of five. No, no, Nobody. I've got number three wrong. Okay, so you have a score of four. Ryan? Uh, two. Two. Aaron? Three. Well, James, you still win anyway. Congratulations. for Thank you for playing Quiz Erection, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, I will develop another quiz called Quiz Erection at yeah. some point, <laughs> and it'll be uh, based on... Uh, cryogenically frozen penises <laughs> there's also a star trek the next generation episode about a guy trying to download his in his intelligence into a computer it does not work spoilers he tries to put himself into data also oh. so there's a theme there <laughs> i'm surprised you don't remember these episodes uh i'm surprised too i don't that i can't that one doesn't come to mind all right i'm glad i brought it up um thank you <laughs> thank you again for playing quiz erection yay Okay, let's, uh, you know, before we go on, a couple things here. This is going to be a long up front for those, for those haters that maybe don't like the long up fronts. Mm-hmm. And we we'll put timestamps in. You can jump around. We'll start with this Apple podcast review from May of 2023. I missed it last time we recorded. The Apple podcast username is, I believe, Cabell. Okay. We'll just go with that. That's my pseudonym. Oh, I want, yeah, that's interesting. Maybe Caleb left this. The headline is Transformers, with a question mark. The review is, most of the talk is about anything but the episodes <laughs> the title says they're covering. Two stars. Oh. Come on. I mean, legitimate gripe, I yeah, guess, yeah. Uh, but, but that's why we have the timestamps, you fucking idiot. That's, <laughs> that's, kind of what we're, that's kind of what we do. Yeah, no, shout out to Mike from Lowellville, a different podcast review, or reviewer who blessed us with the timestamp idea. I'm just kidding. You're not a fucking idiot. But I, I could see how the way we do our show is uh, on the narcissistic side of things. It's, it's not for everyone. It's our it. show. It's oh, right, right, show. right, right, right. I mean, it's but a it does take some hubris. And we do what we want. It takes some hubris on our end to think people give a shit about all the upfront personal mis- stuff. I don't think we're misleading anyone. No. 
Don't if you don't a- want to hear about Caleb's dad torturing people, what or Ryan's kink of the month? Yeah, hey. uh, we don't have to. You don't have to give us. I don't know. I don't think you have to give someone low st- low ratings because it didn't meet your expectations. That's today. what ratings are for. <laughs> okay, I just wish. I, I, I do feel from a, a listener perspective that if you if you didn't have the interaction between you guys on here, the show wouldn't be what it is. So I think the positive ratings you get wouldn't. Wouldn't be the same. I, he gives the show its personality. I, I, Anyone I, can sit there and talk talk through an episode. I agree. That's that's it for, it's the funnest part for me. That was one of the <laughs> that was one of the things Aaron was reluctant to do the series uh, because there are other podcasts doing it. But I was like, not like this. We've, not all boring and shit. <laughs> we, we, we've made it our own. Uh, but uh, I sound like we yeah, we appreciate the reviews. No, it's fine. It's I, fine. I, it's it's fine. fine. It's I fine. really, I, it is fine. But I, it does make me wonder because yeah, some people just are in it for the bots, right, and, or the toys or whatever. And I, so I wonder how many first time listeners slash last time listeners there are we've had, you know, that just didn't leave a review. I'd just be curious to know. Uh, what that That's one of like. the things you can find out when you're immortal. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> That, that's the one thing I'll keep working like on. That that, like that, like character in the Douglas Adams books that is it just an alien who goes to every person in the universe and insults them. You can go to every person and ask right. if they've heard our podcast. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was once, but, uh, you know, all the finger-banging talk. Don't let children listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another classic bad review. Classic. <laughs> so- I listen to every episode. It stinks! <laughs> So let's, uh, you know, let's let's shout out those who are not first time listener, last time lin- listeners, our patrons, Alpha Magnus, Debbie, Jeremy Skeeter, Mr. Sadler, Mike Seibert of Mike Seibert Radio, Bono, Michael Trimblett, OG Justin, Jonathan, Robinus Prime, Classic Daniel, Safubi Samurai, Chandler, J. Soups, Matty V, Nick the Toy Mad Dad, Ken Bockelman, Big Good, DFB Greg Murray, Captain Alexis, Corey, what do we have we here? James and Julia? Uh, Mr. Michael Ordway, Tim Dubs, Jason from Cracktastic Plastic, Thomas, Justin 2, Electric Boogaloo, Triclops, Alex, Simon, New Daniel, Seven the Chronicler, Argonus Prime, the Unknown Patron. Patron. You know who you are. <laughs> Brian Jones and Rick, a.k.a. Autobot 1000. Uh, if you're interested, please scope out the Patreon at patreon.com slash apoddcast and see if the benefits are for you. Now, finally is the time. Ryan. Yo. Mix us up something that is going to fill us with blind, needless rage. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'll entertain myself. I'm enjoying my own little cocktail here. Excellent. Did you make what Ryan's making? Not even slightly, no. Uh, what are you drinking? I, I intended drinking? to... Well, I, I intended to pop the supermarket and then and try and pick up some of the bits and bobs for the, I can't remember the name of it now, the Last Wish, whatever the cocktail that, that uh, is being made at the moment. However, I got caught up. I went for a run this morning, uh-huh. um, a long one. And so now I've concocted something to try and fix me because I'm what, broken. Because uh-huh. um, I ran 18 miles. And wow, you so ran 18 miles this morning? It was not a good idea. It hurts. And um, so this is something I threw together myself, and it is one shot Tia Maria uh-huh. or uh, cough and cure, one shot of amaretto, ice, coconut water. Have you ever made that before? No, I literally I wanted to drink some coconut water because it, the electrolytes right. are fantastic post run, uh-huh. and I also fancied a drink that wasn't a beer. So I thought, yeah. what can I put in it? Tastes like peanut butter. It's really tastes nice. Like, tastes like peanut butter, huh? Yeah, it's lovely. Really, really nice. And I've got my, my, my umbrella because every cocktail should have an umbrella, yeah. in my opinion. Oh, huh, I'd like to try that sometime. We might have, uh, you might want to put that out there to us later so that yeah, maybe course. Ryan can try that out and we'll uh, make a walnut special here some, someday <laughs> and try it on. It is very, it. very pleasant. Ryan, uh, yep. it, it, there appears to be a uh, libation. An us. opalescent green cocktail? <sighs> mm-hmm. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> this is the last word. Uh, this is one of my favorite cocktails that I can't believe I haven't put on the show until now. It's a Prohibition-era cocktail originating around 1915. It fell out of favor pretty quickly but came screaming back into popularity in the early 2000s with the resurgence of older, simpler cocktails and kind of bartending culture. Um, it is equal parts of four ingredients. 
three quarter ounce or twenty two mils of gin, three quarter ounce of green chartreuse, three quarter ounce of maraschino liquor liqueur, three quarter ounce of lime juice, and you combine all ingredients in shaker and shake with ice and then strain into a chilled coupe glass. Cool. And that is what we have. Yep. <laughs> all right, I'm trying the drink. Uh, this is delightful. Yeah, I really love this drink. Let's see what Caleb thinks. Yeah, that's very refreshing. Ah, nailed it. The best part about this drink is that it can be like a Mr. Potato Head cocktail, which means the ingredients can be swapped around almost at will if you adhere to the profile of the components. Like uh, you can combine a strong spirit, like the gin, with an herbaceous one, chartreuse, a sweet liqueur, the maraschino, and a sour mixer like lime in almost limitless ways. Like uh, you can use tequila, angostura, amaretto, and lime, for example, uh, whiskey, drambuie, triple sec, and lemon juice, and it's pretty it's pretty radical. Uh, How to Drink on YouTube has an excellent episode about this very subject. Really Gin good. is just such a great it goes with almost everything. Mixers. Like, it's so there's good. a reason it's in most of the classical cocktails. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Ryan. It's delicious and amazing on its own. Yeah. Before we go on, I just have to make the comment. Let me share my screen here. Couldn't we don't don't we don't we think Oh my god <laughs> that maybe wow, that, that maybe James looks a little bit like <laughs> American adult film star Johnny Sins? I've bit. never seen this guy before. You've never seen this guy? This guy's been fucking shit up since the two <laughs> thousands. No, he doesn't it doesn't look familiar. <laughs> well, God, I hate, I hate it. Back. No, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. Is Johnny Sins on. here with us right now? <laughs> I don't see the resemblance myself. Oh, all right. Well, uh, then uh, let's let's recap the last episode. In the land of the rising sun, battling bots bring brawls, brewing the government's ire for the Autobots' aspiring allies. Rodimus Prime, burdened by the weighty yoke of leadership, yearns to yield his post. Decepticons cunningly capturing the coveted matrix of leadership compel Scourge to crave its awesome might, metamorphosizing him (laughs) into a monstrous, malevolent machination. Amidst this turmoil, a kendo sage skillfully stirs Hot Rod's soul to cease being a timid trembler and seize his sovereign stance once more. Uh, ChatGPT did help me write that, but I think I'm mastering the art of making sure it does something that actually makes sense. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Great. (laughs) I'm having to do all my work for me. (laughs) So let's get things going with The Return of Optimus Prime, written by Marv Wolfman and Sherry Wilkerson. And uh, thank Robot Jesus. We close out the season with our friends at Toei. Toei. Yeah. This episode, the animation is fine. It's not as good as the next one, but. The sweltering heat of a nearby star creates a wave of refraction in our camera's lens. A short distance from that sun is an Earth ship, the Solaris, piloted by scientists Jessica Morgan and Gregory Swafford. They are testing a new heat and radiation resistant alloy that they have developed, and the only way to stress test its true potential is Icarus style. You gotta fly close to that sun. Yeah, certainly not an unmanned probe. <laughs> That's a good, good point. <laughs> but on that journey, they discover a ship with life signs. Question mark. Why? I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's on a collision course with a planet that looks like an asteroid. They somehow tap into the ship's video link, and it's Optimus Prime! I wish they would have still fucked his body up like they did, but you know, like when they left it last time. I have some stuff about that in script deviations, mm-hmm. but yeah, he doesn't. He's supposed to be missing an arm and half his face. This triggers a memory within Gregory sometime before 2005. A lab in which he was employed must have been the victim of one of Megatron's schemes because, at least we understand that, he doesn't, because we see Prime and Megatron, they're scuffling in the lab, and Megatron ultimately throws a beaker of some volatile liquid into some other beakers of volatile (laughs) liquid. There's a huge explosion, and now Gregory has a scar across his face Mm -hmm. from that explosion. And to this day... He holds Optimus Prime accountable 
for this he does, tragedy. He does have a nut against Optimus Prime, not Megatron. And I think even, I mean, even Jessica here says it was the other robot. Uh, but I guess it's just because Prime is here. So maybe <laughs> right. this is a Liam Neeson situation. Uh, are you talking about <laughs> when he beat the a, racist stuff yeah, you yeah, talked yeah, about? Yeah, he, maybe he's just racist. <laughs> I don't know if Liam Neeson is racist, but he did say some dumb shit. <laughs> well, he also just beat up random black guys because his daughter was assaulted by. He went did out he looking. To that? Okay, yeah, he did. There's a pretty funny uh, Atlanta episode that has some um, the references that. Is he in it? Did he beat them yeah. up or just say he went out looking? I can't for remember them. if he did beat them up, but he said he went out looking. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just trolling for black dudes to mess around with. Jessica is trying to convince Gregory that Prime it wasn't responsible for that, but there isn't really time to talk much about that because she's going to go save him. Gregory does join her. They have five minutes to pull Prime's body from his ship before mm-hmm. the ship collides with the planet. And at some uh, after we, they have some standard issue bitching from Gregory, and they but they manage to pull Prime from the shuttle just in time. Kudos to them for dragging that around. I mean, it's zero G. It is massive, oh, though. Like, yeah. the mass would be a problem to move. But they have jetpacks. Yeah. Um, and also, it is pretty retcon. They mean they retcon this completely, not only with the battle damage, but also that Prime was conscious the whole time until he flew into the Nova, or into the asteroid, or whatever, the Quintesson trap. Um, so, But also, the question now becomes, how long ago does this take place? Right. Because it can't be like days before we get to the rest of the story. No, I think his body's in the lab for a while. Yeah, I, I, that's I, what I assume. And they were studying the this yeah. whole for a while. time. This yeah. whole time. Uh, most of season three, because Dark Awakening was way back when, right? I, don't I think know. it's about in the middle. I don't recall anyway, specifically. They had it's the it. first third, I think, isn't it? Something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's early. But they got it. They got him. He's he he Prime is in the ship. Prime's ship then collides with the planet. Star. This was this was confusing it's to me. It's very confusing. No, it's he collides star. with the with the planet, which is really more of an asteroid. It's a planet but then that star. triggers the star that's nearby oh, to really? explode. I, yeah, in the in the in Dark Awakening it's a it's a Quintesson trap that he takes out, but it's just it is confusing. I w- I rolled with it. It doesn't matter. I'm not yeah, mad at yeah, it. Yeah, refresh our memory. The the Quintesson trap. What was what was that? It was supposed to be that asteroid had like a bomb or something on it and they were luring all the Autobots to it and then using Optimus Prime to make them attack it. I guess I think if I okay. recall correctly and then he like basically uh takes it out himself and everybody's safe. <laughs> so I don't know how wrong this, that is. <laughs> so in this if the timelines are synced up, there should be a ship full of Autobots on the outskirts yes. yeah. of this event. Witnessing this. Witnessing all of this. They're like, hey, they snuck in there and took Prime's body. No, it's the Autobots. You, of course <laughs> yeah, they didn't right. notice. Yeah, they, they don't. They probably just turned around and left. <laughs> they did. Yeah, that's what I'm going to assume. They just didn't pay any Peace. attention. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that asteroid is equipped with bombs. That's why it explodes. And then it triggers a nearby star to explode. Supernova. Hey. We can succeed because that means their experimental alloy works because their ship is not being destroyed. It's good yeah. stuff. And we've already mentioned it. Prime's body is in very good condition compared to when we last saw him. The one thing that's concerning is that there's some strange spores coating their monitors. Maybe that's something we can deal with after we're done drinking this champagne over our alloy. Right, right. Back at the lab. So back at the lab, but we don't know how much later, but it's still less than a year because it's still 2006 Six. Eh, in know. the movie world. Uh, you know. All right. We'll say it's December of 2006. <laughs> it's like before Christmas. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see any decorations no. up in, in this episode. No. Well, he doesn't seem like a very jolly guy. No. We're back on Earth. Jessica's father, Mark Morgan, is studying the spores. It turns out they are sentient and seem to have an infectious quality that causes its hosts to go insane with rage at whomever is around. Not only that, the virus is spread via simple contact, creating a a red glow in any creature impacted by the spores. And in this case, we're seeing rats. Have they ever made like these rage rats as like a third party toy? 
No, not to my knowledge. James, you got any rage rats? <laughs> I, I, I'm rage rat free over here. I, I, I actually think it's, it's strange. With the number of weird ra- repaints we get, no one has made any rage-based bright red repaints of anything that I know of. Yeah. Hmm. I think that I, needs to be they, done. They've done golden lagoon ones and done them in gold, which looks cool, but not very practical, <clears throat> but nothing in red. And I think you could definitely do a red Rodimus would probably be an iconic one. You call him Redimus. <laughs> in all fairness, just a decent Rodimus would be a star. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That is a gap in everybody's collection, really, is a decent it, Rodimus. If they really wanted to go all out, I mean, it'd be easy. I think it'd be, well, I say easy. I don't know. But make an all red figure. But to give it like that extra rage, you could make it somehow like could you make it glowy somehow like from the inside like so a weird just put a radium thing, in it a weird thing that a lot of companies will do will make they will make transparent toys yes. so they'll take the model but gun, they'll, gun, I've seen they'll cast it in yeah transparent I saw Gundam so figures last night put the lights mall. in it I would yeah, say, yeah. like red LEDs or something I've seen like half transparent half colored like Gundam mm-hmm. split down the middle right yeah let's there's a third party Com- Mirage you can buy from MMC that d- has that the gold half transparent it- half uh, oh. half normal. Colors. Have they ever done Golden Lagoon stuff? Hasbro has for their main yeah. line. You might recall Haley had a Golden mm-hmm. Beachcomber, um, and some third parties have well, as well. You can get Golden Optimus Primes for sure. Right. Let's, let's... X Transport said Beachcomber um, has got a removable hand. You can put a gold one right. in sketch to simulate right. when he dipped his hand in the in Lagoon. Well, I think it'd be fun. Missed market opportunity, toy fun. companies. Yep. Anyway, sorry for that uh, sidebar, but no, yeah. it's a good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I like the I like the conceit of the of the hate plague. I, I think it's a neat idea. I sometimes wonder if we've been infected with it ourselves. Oh, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like the bath salts of plagues. And it makes <laughs> sense that it's the color red. You know. Well, then we'll talk about. <laughs> That and script negations as well. Wow, so many things. I I'm can't teasing wait. Teasing you. I'm teasing. I'm tickling I'm, your clit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't I'm, don't edge me here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mark and Greg have designs to study and possibly scale this their is findings. The worst plan I've ever heard. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Jessica is is like. Y'all are crazy. Shoot these fuckers back into space. But before the conversation can continue, the terror cons attack the lab because Galvatron wants that heat resisting alloy. That's right. The Technobots show up to save the day a few laser blasts later, and it's Abominus and Computron time. Computron, think too much. <laughs> Com- <laughs> Compy, Compy takes a blast from Abominus and falls into the lab, toppling the ceiling on top of Jessica's leg. Oh, no. Shit. I wonder if she's the same one that was in the well. <laughs> Anybody remember baby Jessica in the well? Uh, yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah. And she'd be about the right age. <laughs> this is kind of a stretch here, man. Maybe so. Um, Get her, put her on Ellen. That's my head. Ugh. That's my head cannon. <laughs> put her on the View. Oh God! Today we've got baby Jessica from the well. Turns out she's like a like a right wing, you know, nut job. Well, we can, we don't know. We we don't know what. Sorry, what Jessica, baby Jessica. I don't know why to. we're speculating oh, about shot, you in that way at all. Shot fires at adult baby Jessica. <laughs> yeah. Turns out she's a philanthropist. She's been getting kids out of wells for the last 25 years. It's a it's a real problem. The Technobots are down. While the Technobots are down, rather, the Terracons disassemble and they make off with the alloy. The Technobots see that Jessica is injured and they summon first aid, who takes Jessica to the hospital, which induces a rage of its own within her father, Mark, who expresses his hate for all robots, his buddy Gregory is, he's like, chill, Holmes. We got the body of Optimus Prime here, and we got these crazy-ass spores. We can totally use that to exact revenge on the Autobots. This is, well, we're not quite there yet, but this is neither here nor there. But whenever, I guess it's right here, when <laughs> that part right there, where the, the father is yelling about, Whatever he's mad about, and um, he just face just looks like Neil Breen. That's it. If I knew who Neil Breen was, I would. You haven't find seen that reference hilarious. You haven't seen um, Fateful Findings. Mm-mm. I showed you the trailer. It's the it's so good and terrible. It's the best bad movie ever. Oh, I do remember. Yes, yes. He's and throwing I, think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> I've hacked into almost all the things I need. Oh. 
He has some other movies that are great too. That's Ooh. it. So the uh, these guys, Gregory and Mark, they are as thick as Tewsbury mustard. For the Shakespeare fans out there. My goodness. <laughs> Even by his own memory, Megatron clearly caused the problems for Gregory. And it's also clear that the Terracons were the instigator of this whole thing. So, I mean, the Technobots hung back and helped. Sure. So everything is irrational it doesn't in regard help. to these guys who are supposed to be also, pretty intelligent. It doesn't, it doesn't help us move the plot line forward, though, if they're thinking rationally, Aaron. Yeah, and also, I mean, I agree with you. It's frustrating. Hatred isn't necessarily rational. No, it um, certainly is not. But also, their plan, after seeing how super contagious this is with biological beings, seems relatively short sighted. Oh, Before they true. even hate robots. Yeah. They're like, let's get this into a factory. The father didn't seem to be mad at robots until, like, he turned real quick. Right, yeah. <laughs> he went from no opinion about robots. To all robots must be murdered. Maybe Gregory's been ear, like earworming him. Well, this is a, another great, you know. Met, hate is contagious. Wow. Hate to hate. That's what I say. That is <laughs> okay. This is a deep metaphor. Mm. Uh, is is Gregory just uh, Zamont and Tomax? Yes, a little bit. Oh, also, I guess we're being charitable. I mean. It is weird because Gregory picks up that a bag question mark of the spores and squeezes it. Oh, I did not. Yeah, we didn't call that out. The dust isn't red, so maybe it has to go through some processing or something. I don't know. Whatever. Maybe well, that means that they made the hate plague. right. Basically, they maybe they are. We don't see the effect because they're already angry. <laughs> Maybe, Caleb. <laughs> so the only cure against the hate plague is being angry to begin with. <laughs> the only inoculation against it, I guess. Well, they're giving out, they're, we'll find out it's wisdom. They're, uh, they're giving out vaccines. It just makes people mad already. Maybe that's just dust from the rubble. I don't know, man. Uh, but why would he pick that up? He's so strong. <laughs> I've always thought that was just a rock. That he's just picked up yeah, some rock. I agree. And he's being really angry, and some dust came off it. But yeah, yeah that does seem a little bit strong. <laughs> he's crushing it, some rubble. It doesn't mm -hmm. look that red to me. It doesn't look red. But I, why so. would he pick it up? Yeah. He's just picking up the rubble of his lab like, fuck, they fucked up my lab. And now he's like crushing it. Like they, I, he's oh, like, they, I didn't they, even think of that. Yeah, he's like, he's like they messed. They, first they messed up my face and now they're messing <laughs> up my lab and uh i it would have i think would have topped it off as he would have picked up that rock and then just clunk sure. clunked it off of optimus's that would have been bodies uh, that would have been great head like plonk he's like see i told you mark they yeah. do punch a couple of robots in this episode i'm surprised no he's on smack around Ops optimus's you know you just they, you, you just, turn on the lab light at three in the morning he's fucking his face oh jesus <laughs> i mean yeah <laughs> Anyway, That's yeah, exactly I, I think he's just, was thinking. I think he's just picking up rubble and mad about. You know, here, this is just proof, of, but more proof that these guys have got to go. There are inconsistencies that we'll see the a hate bit. plague infection a little bit. So we're going to the hospital. Uh, we see Jessica having a hard time. Then we go back to <laughs> Greg and Mark's lab. They're experimenting on Op Optimus. We go back to the hospital. More Jessica surgery stuff. Back to the lab. I like the Prime is still a work in progress. I like the parallel. Yeah, it's neat. Then Jessica is awake. <clears throat> Greg and Mark storm the hospital halls only to, oh no, what have these monsters done to you? <sighs> yeah, so they, they gave Jessica lay, like an exoskeleton leg so she can walk because theoretically, you know, her spine was damaged. I feel like a scientist wouldn't necessarily be against an exoskeleton. His upset here seems a little outsized but it's like a kid's cartoon and it moves the plot forward so i'm not that mad at it it's just weird i feel like it would have been just as effective if she'd been paraplegic like even more so maybe yeah somewhere chip they, chase is like sitting around going what the fuck guys yeah you do this the whole time <laughs> so it does make me wonder if that's why or what well, non canon I'm, I'm sure but why chip chase suddenly disappears when you hit 2005 because they've invented that technology and he's gone great Fine, see you guys. I'm off to go and live a full life all... that doesn't involve getting squashed by robots. <laughs> I, yeah. I like that idea. I'm it's tired a... of bailing your asses if I was, out. If I was, <laughs> if I was Chip, I would get out of that that terrible 
codependent relationship. It's also dodgy territory to wade into, let's fix you, because you're fucked up. <laughs> like, that's a little sensitive. True. We don't know why Chip is paraplegic. It's true. Um, but we could assume that Jessica would appreciate being able well, to Well, we established he's faking because he cut that fucking football Ooh, or whatever true. it was that one time. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> It's a he's big like Lebowski that, situation. I was gonna say, I was gonna say it's like that uh, one of the suitors from something about Mary. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that's better because the big Lebowski actually he was, was paraplegic. But it's a goddamn gold bricker. This fucking guy walks. So first aid collaboed. We never did comment. His last name is Chase. You can chase oh. somebody in a wheelchair. Oh. Did you guys ever see that Craigslist ad where it was I want to chase someone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. That's very funny. <laughs> and you need to re- really try to outrun me. And if I catch you, say something like, you're really fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That reminds me, I think we played it on here, the Craigslist ad of the guy who just wanted somebody to come into the hotel room, turn on Super Mario Brothers, and play through the first level. They had to like take off their clothes, lay on a bed, play through the first level, and they had to hit the flag just right to trigger all of the fireworks <laughs> and then he would enter her <laughs> oh i don't remember that that is super specific i don't that, know that's a classic craigslist i don't know if that's a craigslist ad you probably need to go to like only fans for that or something you need to get a professional <laughs> anyway anyway First aid collaboed with Dr. Human on a hot track called, Hey, lady, you got legs now. Oh, Jesus. Mark, Mark, Mark is not impressed with that song. He calls her, <laughs> <laughs> he calls her a robot. I was working on that pretty late the other night. He, he says that they're trying to turn her into a robot when clearly it's a cyborg. Uh, is that right? Yeah, cyborg is living material with um, machine parts. Right. I mean, technically, somebody with a mechanical arm is a cyborg. The Autobots were, I was just mixing that. I always sometimes mix up Cyborg and uh, what's Android? Data? Android, yeah. The Autobots were just trying to help. After all, Jessica can walk. Jessica totally gets it. But her father is thick as dust in vacant chambers. <laughs> Alfred Tennyson. <laughs> oh, Jesus. All right. <laughs> Greg it's a and- highbrow episode, folks. <laughs> Greg and Mark failed to resurrect. Oh, well, I guess I think we're transitioning back to a <laughs> transitioning back to the lab. They, they, they're not happy. Nobody's happy ever. <laughs> <laughs> they're real mad. Yeah, they can't get prime working. And the and the virus or but not virus. The spores don't infect uh, dead material. Too bad. Yeah, it's so sad. <laughs> By the way, whenever I've been as I was doing my notes, this Ninja Turtles movie it is came nonstop on all the time. Yeah. They're pushing it hard. It looks cool. It does look cool. I'll go see it. Maybe. I'm into it. Back at the lab. Back at the lab. Greg and Mark have failed to resurrect Optimus Prime, but it's okay. They can melt him down for more raw material for the alloy. These sick fucks. Mm -hmm. More. Yep. Prime is loaded on a long conveyor. He slowly proceeds towards the blazing furnace and as jessica this, screams for them to stop that's where we go to commercial this lab is amazing it is a huge facility they have a lot of equipment yeah for three people yeah <laughs> where where are they getting their funding from uh jeffrey epstein there, yep <laughs> got it up to now james how are you feeling about this episode what is it doing for you so for me this bit, I mean, it's a bit of preamble. We, we've skipped, well, well, not skipped over. We've gone over the, the the massive retcon at the start that almost confused me, even more as a kid. I was like, no, I know what happened, and this isn't it. But, yeah, you know what? The whole point of this is to de-traumatise all the kids that watch the movie and then Dark Awakening. I can see why they retconned it. I can see why they didn't have zombified, smashed-up Prime sitting there, dead, getting... Pulled about by humans, that would have been a bit odd. Yeah. Um, to me, this didn't necessarily have to have been a two-parter. They could have glossed over this much faster and, and got on to the, the, the interesting bit. But in a way, I'm glad it is, because it's nice that they actually had a bit of build-up. It wasn't that that usual, oh, look, here's a MacGuffin, let's go into the meat of the episode. There, there is a bit of build-up to it. It's quite nice. I don't yeah. think there's 
much filler really within the two I, parts. Um, I like the two parts. I will say the second one, and this is not a pejorative. I like it. Is very talky, but it does night. But I think they give it room to breathe because Optimus is back. Basically, yeah. yeah. I, I I think you're almost obligated to have a two parter for when Optimus Prime, yeah, legitimately returns, and you're ending the entire G1 series. Uh, did they well, know that they were entering the? Did they well, know? they're not. There's ending technically it. a season. Oh, yeah, yeah, three, uh, that's yeah right, we that's right. we, uh, we have three more left. Kayla. That's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I mean I agree. I didn't. Uh, I feel like if it were one part, we would be saying I wish it were two. Yeah. The, yeah, I'll say it didn't need to be, but I'm glad it is. I think it's better this way. If I have the production timelines right, they were probably working on season three in tandem with the movie, right? Um, or the movie was, I know it was in production during season two. I'm just trying to figure out how the movie and season three overlap. They had to be because the movie came out in August and season three started in September. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So they probably started getting feedback on this whole, uh, killing Optimus Prime made my kid cry thing. Yeah. And And that's why, but they had already started production on dark awakening and it almost feels like. Oh, that made your kid cry. Wait, wait till you see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's just awful. It's pretty bad. <laughs> Zombie Prime. <laughs> we're back. Or we're back from break. Jessica pleads to her dad, Gregory, "Don't destroy Prime. The Autobots helped her. He is their leader." But this, she unintentionally sparks a plan in Mark and Gregory. By God, she's right. They can use Prime's body as a lure to bring the Autobots to the lab and then sprinkle some of that crimson crack on them. Mm -hmm. So they command Jessica, go find an Autobot, any Autobot. Any Autobot. (laughs) Just go stand on a street corner, find an Autobot. Hey, (laughs) boys. They command her, go find an Autobot, inform them of Optimus Prime's whereabouts. And despite Jessica's counter arguments, Mark remains Thick as stars which storm the sky on autumn nights. I'm your dad. Do what I say. I didn't write the quote down. Or the who do, who, who said it? Uh, yeah. Some. It was me. <laughs> it was me, boys. <laughs> uh, yeah, and she says, um, "I hate it. I hope I end up don't end up hating you." And I was kind of pissed off. I forgot about this component. I was pissed off about that. I'm like, "Fuck your dad!" But she almost immediately. I mean, she basically immediately tells oh, yeah. Magnus the whole plan. Yeah. Here, I'll capture that, because it's really good acting, actually. Dad, it's wrong. The Autobots aren't our enemies. They aren't? Look at Gregory's face. Look at your legs. They're paralyzed because of those metal menaces. No, I'm not wrong, honey. You are. Do what I say, because I'm your father. And you know I'm right. All right. All right, I'll do it. But I hate it. I just hope I don't also learn to hate you. There we go. It'd be funny if they high fived. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck your daughter's feelings. <laughs> we have uh, Ultra Magnus entering the Metroplex compound, carrying Jessica. She's informed him of what she knows of her father's plan, and she needs to tell <sighs> Rodimus Prime. I love Rodimus standing in front of the dumpiest statue of Optimus Prime I ever did see. <laughs> I'm not the leader you were. I, I do like this because it kind of does call back a little bit to our previous episode where uh, Rodimus is questioning his leadership and, and stuff like that. Um, but another just a purely technical thing that I noticed even as a kid that I never could unsee was how Rodimus's head bobs back and forth. Yeah, there. I... <laughs> it's it's like what is he gulping something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, girl. <laughs> yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, girl can have penises. No, so. I, I wasn't thinking penis for once. <laughs> I was thinking like you know, like Night at the Roxbury. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, Rodimus uh, feeling all sad for himself. Unbeknownst to the Autobots at this time, we should say a spy, Ratbat, is in their mitts. You gotta love those tapes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're always there when you need them. I guess laser it does feel beak. like a little bit, almost like a call back to the movie of the sure. laser beak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, it almost it almost feels deliberate that they could have done that so many different ways. Yep. I, 
You know, they haven't really used the tapes as a spy trope that much in season They used three. it a little yeah. bit, but not as much as season two. Um, and I guess Laserbeak is to retired. <laughs> yeah. The, and the Autobots never did that. Why didn't the Autobots... I mean, you can't send Ramhorn, I guess. Maybe the Lion one, Steeljaw. They didn't Sending really have good spies. spies. No, they yeah. didn't. <laughs> yeah. We got Ratbat checking in on the scene. Swope and Ultra Magnus... Fill Rodimus in on Greg and Mark's scheme. The Autobots have to retrieve the Optimus's body, though. They gotta put him where he can rest in peace. Rodimus knows it's a trap, but we're gonna put together an assault force mm-hmm. anyway. We have a whole robot roll call at mm-hmm. this point. The Protectobots, Aerialbots, Throttlebots, Blur, Bumblebee, Steeljaw, and Wheelie. We're gonna roll out. And Ratbat will depart we, as well. We sort of have, we have this awesome roll call where Ultra Magnus calls out everyone by name and then is like, oh, and the throttle bots too. <laughs> yeah. You guys get in yeah. here. He calls out each the name of each of the aerial bots and protecto bots and then is just like, throttle bots. Throttle bots were also there. <laughs> Do you- it, it does feel like. It's a good example of of I, 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 okay, I know I know it's a kid's cartoon, but mm-hmm. of the difference is like he seems to have thought that, like thought about this much more tactically than than the seasons one and two would have shown. He's, he's actually thinking about, ah, oh, because he, he mentions, I think, the Decepticons have been here before, they might come back, and then he puts out patrols, whereas seasons one and two, <laughs> eight Autobots turn up and walk in the front door. And it, right. it's, it's, it, 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 it does show him in a very different light as a leader and as a competent one. It's true. In season one and two, they're be- like the Autobots are almost exclusively reactionary. Yeah. Yeah, this... I've actually written down proactive rod here. So, yes, I think that's the point I was trying to get at. So, yeah, he, he is a very proactive leader, whereas Optimus was much more reactive. And uh, I'm guessing that would be a reflection on the fact that Optimus was more more of a cautious leader. Mm-hmm. But if you put these out uh, into you know more uh, human terms, he'd be a much more cautious leader, much more reactionary. Whereas I think there are plenty of examples of Rodimus just wanting to go out and shoot Decepticons because he likes it. He's a risk taker. Yeah, I, well, he's no also... No risk, no reward. To be, like, we mentioned this in a couple episodes. He's only been leader for, what, a year, two years, maybe? Um, and I think that that's the nice um, dynamic between him and Ultra Magnus, where Ultra Magnus is kind of that component of the careful, like, commander. Yeah. Where Rodimus is more, like, delegative. He's like, you know this, you do it. Prime I make the decisions an and you carry them out. Prime did like yeah. He's basically is. Uh, oh, uh, I wish Caleb were here in Romance of the Three Kingdoms terms. Um, you have a uh, an advisor. There's a oh, more for- there's a more formal <laughs> word, but I can't think. The of it hand right of the king, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you have anything in script deviations, Ryan, about the whole the Throttlebots and their? I don't lack of importance in this episode i, I really. just i just all i did was mention it here was like it does seem like it's thrown in as a um uh total second thought where yeah. they don't even get names and one of them i think is missing right one's missing uh and they have void vo- excuse me credits but i don't think any of them speak in this either i don't think they speak until the rebirth. i think they speak in they speak in the next episode they speak in the, right. part two i'm pretty sure i can hear them shouting by me Really, loudly. <laughs> I had all of the throttle bots as a kid uh, because they were pretty cheap. Yep, and they were distributed in grocery stores. So every time we'd go to <laughs> con- consumers when I was a kid, was consumers. a grocery store chain around here. They had what a perfect bots. name for a store. <laughs> I know, isn't it? <laughs> just putting it out there. That's just very John Carpenter <laughs> like. <laughs> Consume. You're all customers. Just see an open wallet backing into the store. That's their logo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the Autobots approach the lab, and, and and James, to your point, we've never seen that. Like this is a proper strike force mm-hmm. that, and they even assign them different roles. They duties, have a plan. Right? Rodimus like, says, "Ultra Magnus, you and um, the aerial bots circle, and the throttle bots, I think, circle around. Defensor remains outside, and Rodimus he's back up." And Jessica go in the front door to get Optimus's body. No, no, actually, the, front door. the guys going around the back are supposed to get Optimus's body. That's right. That's, that's where right. they think it is. That's right. They go in the front door as a diversion. So, because we'll see, despite this careful plan that we've never seen from the Autobots, it fails. It does, but <laughs> not their fault. It was a good uh, trap. Right. Yep. 
did I go past a scene? I think I missed something. I think, uh, yeah, I fast forwarded too far. I'm sorry, Oh, guys. we missed where Ratbat came back to talk to. Yeah, we did miss that shit. My bad. That's all right. Well, just know that before the scene we just talked about, Ratbat returned. They're in a stadium. Yeah. <laughs> what is this, triple takeover? <laughs> Good callback. <laughs> Galvatron believes that Prime may live, but the Decepticons are going to eliminate that possibility. Here we get another thing where Toei had a problem with faces. (laughs) (laughs) Soundwave's mask doesn't move when he turns his head. It's real fucking weird. Optimus Prime may live, but not for much longer. (laughs) That's my Galvatron. Did you like it? (laughs) Uh He definitely is fierce. (laughs) We're having cat technical difficulties right now. Okay. Cat, cat. on the table. <laughs> Rodimus. He's all slumped and, and, down there. And... Yeah, they just threw him in a corner. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> they threw Op- Optimus is on the floor with his legs splayed. <laughs> yeah, Rodimus and Jessica, they enter the lab. They immediately find Optimus Prime's body, but that wasn't supposed to be here, th- which means the guys around back have fallen into a trap. Uh, you've got Magnus, the aerial bots, the throttle bots. They're stuck in a glass cage, and they've all been infected by spores. They're just immediately uppercutting mm-hmm. anybody in their path. Aerial bots form Superion, which busts through the roof of the building <laughs> and creates some damage that allows the other infected Autobots to escape. And uh, that's where we see the Protectobots get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Yeah, um, I also, if you think Ultra Magnus saying, where's that punk Rodimus Prime, I want him, didn't make me giggle just like it did when I was a kid, you'd be wrong. I thought that was quite interesting, actually, because everyone else is quite happy to fight the closest um, Autobot. Yeah. Whereas, it, it kind of makes you wonder, is he carrying a little bit of resentment of Rodimus taking the Matrix? Because he, he follows him throughout the mm-hmm. entire he does. episode. Uh yeah no that makes that's a good point like I would say that there's probably buried deep down in Ultra Magnus some uh, hostility toward uh, Rodimus but he doesn't let it affect his job. It is unclear how the virus impacts you psychologically, other than it makes you filled with plague. Rage. Please, it's not a virus or plague. Uh, well, uh, so it's bacterial. Yes, it's a spore. It's oh, a spore. Yeah. Okay, all right. I, I, think I wrote virus a bunch too. Well. What's yeah. that? I think it's a little bit unclear how uh, an organic spore affects a non-organic robot, but, you know, for the sake of the episode, yeah. I was just... Right, right. But in some cases, it just makes all-out brawls happen or riots, and then in some cases, they seem to have some intellectual understanding. Like, some in some yeah. places, they seem like they're devoid of all personality and have just become these rabid... Monsters, like, yeah. Right. And then you've got, we'll see later, Cyclonus seems mm-hmm. to be able to lead the Decepticons. And, mm. but, and the Combiners seem to be able to get along well enough to combine. Combine, yeah. Um, I don't know how thought out it is. Probably not much. Probably, they're probably <laughs> like, I think, hmm, if I'm being charitable, I would be like, uh, we just need this to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> right. And a giant infected combiner is cooler than yeah the five five, guys. five bozos. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like they bust through the living room of the it Simpsons. Did. There's, <laughs> I was confused as to where. So so Ultra Magnus busts through a wall and it before he does it, it's confusing because it looks like there's family pictures on the wall and it's a beige wall. It just looks like a house, but we find out it's the lab. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couch. Dun 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 dun. dun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is the Kool-Aid man going to have the that hate was, plague? That was is that why he's red? That was red? a total Kool-Aid <laughs> play right there. Magnus is coming after Rodimus and Jessica as they uh, haul Prime's corpse through the lab's hallways. Uh, like an animatronic horror prop, Mark Morgan shows up out of nowhere and attempts to drop dust on Rodimus. He fails. I guess he doesn't see that his daughter's inside of him. Or just doesn't care. His hate for robots is so... Maybe... It's blinding him. Maybe Rodimus's windshield is polarized. We'll go with that. Yeah. Tent- that means they can see well in the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta protect whatever. I tried on polarized <laughs> sunglasses for the first time like a month or two ago. 
and it blew my mind. Yeah, they're pretty, <laughs> they're pretty great. You know, you've never had Polaroid sunglasses? No, I'm probably going to go blind. I never really wear sunglasses. I always just oh. buy cheap ones at gas stations if I need them. Well, that's something, but yeah. But no, polarized sunglasses are the shit. Yeah, they're great. How much does that shit cost? Not too much. All right, well, Technology maybe I should do that's only been around for 100 years. <laughs> If only he'd worn polarized sunglasses. <laughs> just oh, <laughs> it's just empty sockets. <laughs> Jar thrown. The Decepticons arrive. Bruticus, Stunticons, Galvatron. The Autobots immediately infect them, which freaks Galvatron out, and he's just like, <laughs> he's just like peace out, Burgundy bitches. Yeah, he's not. That's one of my favorite moments. Is the irony of what he says. What like they so something like they've gone crazy or something? They've gone yeah. crazy. This is no place for them. Like, this this is no place for me. And I'm thinking you're going for Tron. Yeah, this is exactly the place for you. We see a lot of that. I I think that maybe is it when is in the next episode when um yeah when he's fighting Cyclonus and the rest of the Decepticons and they're all he says they're all crazy. I just yeah. think it's funny the role reversal. Yeah. Also, I quite like uh, Rodimus's comment about happy Decepticons. So it's just like so him. Whatever makes you a happy Decepticon. <laughs> I kind of want to capture that they're all crazed line. All right. Whereabouts does that happen? It was. It's right before he flies away, I think. Is it? Might as well just grab all this. One moment. We've come for Optimus. Where are you hiding that coward? The Autobots are acting like madmen. It's a madness plague, Galvatron. If one of those Transformers touches you, you're infected. You're lying! Fine. Whatever makes you a happy Decepticon, just watch your rear thrusters. They've all gone mad. This is no place for me! He flies away so gracefully. I feel like the fusion cannon illustrations are a little different Weird. than they were. And I feel like it. Inf- I, I'm having flashbacks to when we were in... Uh, our briefcase days mm-hmm. in elementary school. Caleb remembers as well because we would tell him to run away. <laughs> Get so, out of here. Just leave us to our briefcases, Caleb. We don't want to play kickball. What? But it, I remember the drawings we would make and trade. I think you are influenced by that because I remember some weird... Uh, Maybe. Does that that doesn't strike any memory uh, with you? Okay. I mean, the cannon... Ch- like, yeah, in this one, there's a lot more where it looks like a sausage as opposed to tapering kind of. Right. And I I don't hate it. Just noticing it, and I don't hate you, Caleb. Oh, I, Not I, anymore. I, I was. Fu- I went on my merry way. I, I didn't leave being like, oh, they we saw you crying. It's like, oh, I know. I was having a good time. <laughs> I felt. So- I felt sorry for you guys. Well, that was your first mistake. Yeah, we were doing just fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll never forget the day Caleb showed up with a briefcase, and we were like, "Nice try, Carter. Wait, no, Get out of here." <laughs> no, what's a briefcase? Look. <laughs> like a fake briefcase that's a trapper keeper yeah. i see the lisa frank drawings all <laughs> over it fucking airbrush bitch uh, yeah. i don't know wow yeah, got a little anger here yeah. is it lisa frank or lisa ann it's lisa frank lisa frank all right she made lisa it ann is a porn actor <laughs> oh whoa bringing it back to that i wonder if she's ever worked with johnny sins she works a ton <laughs> so probably i think she pl- she does a lot she did a lot of uh sarah palin Oh, yeah. That was kind of a comeback to her. Mm-hmm. C-U-M. <laughs> Come on. All right. On. All right. Hey. This is a weird one. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All right. <laughs> We've got Blur. We've got Bumblebee. Cup. Along with a human strike force, they approach an infected Superion, but he blasts them all to hell. They got pretty lazy with these blasts. Superion, they just recycle him blasting at the ground over and over. And it's Galvatron's blast sound effect. I for love the, the bas- <laughs> yeah sound it makes, though. Uh, so they're uh, incapacitated. Yep. And uh, Defensor shows up to save some humans on a bridge. This will... The action of this sequence is somewhat uh, unclear, Boy. but but I think he's trying to save humans on a yeah. bridge. But ultimately, uh, in that battle, he is grazed by Superion and is also mm-hmm. infected. Notes, comments? I already said the bazing thing. <laughs> what a value add, Ryan. <laughs> That's... They really want us to see Teenage Mutant Ninja no Turtles. No shit. Mutant Mayhem. <laughs> Playing in theaters. Right now. Rodimus pulls into an 
uh, an Autobot repair base somewhere. I, I'm assuming we're back at Metroplex. Metroplex, we are. Retgar is heading up this facility, and there's nothing that Retgar can do for Optimus Prime. But what about the Quinnasons? They created Optimus Prime. I guess uh, we're not going to give credit to Alpha Trion. For that. Yeah, oh, I've got that written down, actually. Is, was it not Alpha Trion? And Again, it's an interesting callback to the movie that he brings into Retgar, and it makes you wonder how dead was Ultra Magnus in the movie in mm-hmm. comparison to Optimus. You know, we actually even addressed this, why they didn't bring Optimus to the Junkions, and I think we landed on he was just dead too long. Hmm. That I don't know if there's anything in the canon that explores that. Like I don't know. Did, Maybe Ultra Magnus wasn't dead. He no. was only he mostly was just, dead. Right. <laughs> I think we said that. I think you could argue that. But maybe there's something about, well, they don't talk about sparks in this canon. Yeah. But there's something about, like, your, maybe his heart was still beating, but because his head was f- separated from his body, so he couldn't speak. I don't know, man. I it's had, all speculation. I Also, James, I had that note about, like, yeah, Alpha Trion's the one who made Optimus from Orion Pax. I, I kind of let it slide just because the Quintessons created the Transformers. Yeah, but yeah I, I, exactly, yeah. It just felt a bit bit harsh for to help a try on. Yeah. They're giving a lot of credit to the Quintessons. More yeah. credit than they deserve. And then this is And, this... and the Quintessons weren't even around by the time Prime was alive. They'd already been driven off. Driven away from the planet. Um, I like I like how they're bringing the Quintessons into play because it's like uh they're all having to work together to overcome mm-hmm. this yeah. thing. I love it when enemies work together. Yep. And then we see that with the Decepticons as well. Um, but uh, also in this scene, Rekgar makes three uh, trans- er, t- Star Trek, the original series, references in a row. <laughs> yeah, that's nice stuff. After a Lucy reference. How long after that Star Trek what, did this uh, did this happen? Well, Star Trek was in this, was 60. I, I, think I mean, so- that specific movie where Spock died. Oh, number th- two? Yeah. Or was it? We just talked about it a couple episodes ago. So, like, right? well, no, we like, talked about number four. How, how current was that when he was dropping? Uh, it would have been probably six, seven years. Okay, okay, that's all. Okay, okay. I think it's less. Um, I think there were more. It's like three. Well, wasn't the first Star Trek movie like 1980 or something oh, like that? We'll just I have, saw we'll, Star we'll, Trek. There's no way to find out. In no, the we, we'll never know. We'll this never is know. Very editable conversation. We'll never know. <laughs> and now I'm leaving it in course there's <laughs> nothing i can do about it let's see there's nothing you can say that i cannot leave in <laughs> rodimus gets skylinks on the horn yep. and command and skylinks is flying around in space i don't know what he's up to but <laughs> he says go get me a quinison any quinison <laughs> go get me a quinison <laughs> and magnus then shows up he breaks into autobot city as rodimus is attempting to disconnect metroplex because mm-hmm. boy that would be a disaster right as rodimus is flipping some switches we see creeping up behind him is ultra magnus and that's when we go to commercial this show is sponsored by better help when we started this project we had no idea if it would work how it would work or how long it would last we jumped in with both feet and we're excited to find ourselves enjoying the experience and eager to continue and years later we continue to look forward to every recording session We love the content that we create, the artwork we make, and most of all, the friendships we've developed along the way. But it certainly isn't easy, and the path forward isn't always clear. We have to plan ahead and dedicate ourselves to keep moving forward with a goal in mind on our terms. But first and foremost, we believe that you should commit to taking care of yourself so that you can trust yourself to make the decisions that align with what you truly want and act on them with confidence and excitement. We believe that talking to someone that can help you navigate through and identify the root of your fears and uncertainties can get you on a healthy path forward. And that's why we recommend BetterHelp. With BetterHelp, you can access a network of licensed, accredited, and experienced therapists who can help you find your way by working through a range of issues, including uncertainty, anxiety, confusion, boundary issues, lack of confidence, and more. All you need to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Autopod today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, 
H-E-L-P dot com slash autopod. Yeah. There must be a camera out in space because Skylink literally turns around and talks to the uh, camera. <laughs> I assume there's a satellite out there that's yeah. probably on a, on a spa- near a space station. They have sure. the, the galactic uh, yeah, man. whatevers. Yep. Um, <laughs> I also <laughs> I will say here that I, I like crazy Ultra Magnus. I feel like this must have been a fun like voice acting thing for Jack Angel to do Ultra Magnus this way. Because he's pretty out there. Right. It's uh, There's a lot of yelling. <laughs> well, I, was just, I was just just questioning, like, how disconnected, just stepping back a, a couple of seconds, how, like, what do they mean when they say they disconnected Metroplex? Because the way he apologizes to him, it kind of sounds like he's killing him. That's, I, like, that's the way it comes across, or putting him in a coma. Like, that is, I, it's a very strange way that it's phrased and... Yeah, I I read it as putting him into stasis or a coma or something like that because what Metroplex says I understand after Rodimus says I'm sorry to do this. Um, he definitely, I mean, I I don't think he kills him because he doesn't have that kind of <laughs> it doesn't have that kind of gravitas. We're euthanizing um, you, Metroplex. Yeah, <laughs> that sorry about that. extreme. Yeah. You're just city mode from now on. See, so yeah, I think they basically just maybe there's some way to disconnect the higher functions from the the city. Yeah. I I've also got written down Vampire Rod and Dancing Rod, which I think is in relation to an animation era and then what happens next, which I think's fantastic his uh, his moves. Let's check it out. After oh. the commercial? Yeah, so yeah, oh. so I think about now where you've got it paused on. <clears throat> this Magnus coming up in the reflection. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, hey, oh. Keep away from me. <laughs> <laughs> Which this brings up another question. I do you just have to touch a very specific part of Metroplex to infect him? <laughs> I get it. Yeah, does yeah. not just walking well, around inside of him do I, anything. I, or is me, maybe he's disconnecting him remotely. Maybe they're not technically in that's, Metroplex huh. proper. That's the way I took it. Was because Metroplex is connected to Autobot City, so I kind of like in my mind put it in like he's not directly in contact with Metroplex. I'm going to go with that for the sake of simplicity. And not arguing something stupid. <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> and they've got brick walls inside of Autobot City. Yep. Sometimes masonry is the way to go. Ultra Magnus tries to cut him off, and then Rodimus just jumps over him, transforms, and runs away. And he's like, I'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Magnus is not going to give up the chase. We, I kind of glossed over it. I was enjoying the animation. But, there, yeah, there is a chase sequence. Uh, Magnus drives through a brick wall to block him off, and then Rodimus does some fancy moves and, uh, but, and gets away. Mm-hmm. But in a moment, we're going to see Magnus corner Rodimus in an alley. Mm-hmm. And when all seems lost for Rodimus, Rekgar lassos magnus saving the day or not because <laughs> magnus infects retgar who then infects rodimus prime i'm a peppa wouldn't you like to be a peppa too <laughs> it, it feels like ultra magnus is pretty strong i don't know the just tossing a thing around him would i'm not sure what the plan was <laughs> yeah i mean we're not going to call out all the animation errors but there's some coloring errors where it's like before rodimus is infected he's red there's a lot of that <laughs> Okay. Hey, yeah. In the I, news today. I love this. We cut to uh, an anchor for K-Sun TV named um, Bonnie Carlson. I love the outfit she's wearing. Yeah. It is a power anchor outfit. It's great. So ruffly and a, and a jacket. Yeah. Pearls. Fuck yeah. Her hair is done up real nice. Well, we. <laughs> this is a news report. Uh, a hate plague is spreading across Earth. And uh, Transformers, humans, is there any cure or end? Are we all going to fucking die? This is a fun thing to watch after COVID. (laughs) We have a montage at this point of rioting and uh, Transformers, humans, just generally messing stuff up across the world. Mm -hmm. It's like a game of tag. (laughs) Is I don't know if the script alludes to this. Is there any kind of, um, I don't know, is there something that drives... The infected to infect others is that the goal? I don't think it says anything in the script. Uh, I, that seems to be the implication from the way they behave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, messing they, up Washington D.C. I guess it's, it's supposed to be the 
uh, Washington Monument a that defense or throws at the Lincoln Memorial, though the Washington Monument looks all like fucked up. It's not what it looks like at all. On some unknown space rock, a Quintesson is being chased by a horde of hate infected Sharkticons. Skylink shows up on the scene, offers a much needed lift for the tentacled scoundrel, but only if he will restore Optimus Prime to life. I'll do it. I'm Starscream. <laughs> How did the hate plague get here? Mm. I've got that written down as well. How did it get into space? Well, you know, the here, I'll just make up a storyline. Uh, the Combaticons right. oh. are infected. You've got one of those guys turns into a shuttle. Blast off. Blast off. He just went into space and started touching people. He said, hey, there's Sharkticons. Bloop. Yep. That's it. All right, we got it My out. theory was that when oh. the sun exploded, it just landed on other places. Oh. Also makes sense. No. So I've written down as well, or, or tying back in with the, that whole thing with Ultra Magnus and the resentment, it's interesting that the Sharkticons are very specifically working together mm-hmm. to attack the Quintesson, which seems like another callback to the movie where they rebel against mm-hmm. the Quintesson rule. Yeah, sure. There is a rise up against your masters sort of element to this. Is this a pro workers episode? Yeah, man. You turn red. all right so this episode is all about the fear of the spread of communism and socialism or is it well i guess yeah because they're trying to stop it yeah yeah man shoot so much subtext that we're uncovering or making up completely we'll just say reaganomics (laughs) news anchor did look a lot like margaret thatcher that's all i'm gonna say Back in the uh, repair bay in Autobot City, the Quintesson starts its task. It won't be easy, and we see lots of soldering and lab accidents and slapstick. Uh, but this better work because they're counting on Optimus to know how to handle this disease. Uh, it's the final attempt. If this doesn't work, Optimus Prime will never live again. The lever is pulled. A blinding light envelops the room, and the silhouette of Optimus Prime rises from its chair. Our leader is back. I've done it. We might as well capture that because it's a good. Li- it's, it's a, a good pretty line. iconic. And then Prime oh, speaks. Yeah. Oh, I like this part too. Jolly good show. Legs are operative now. The arms. Kai Link's a snout. <laughs> You did that on purpose. It was an accident. There's no time left for mistakes. The world needs a leader now. Optimus. I've done it. Optimus Prime lives. It's true. Our leader is back. Yes, Skylinks. And this time, no force in the universe can stop me. Yeah. He's back. Wow. At long last. I've got chills. They're multiplying. Oh, no. I knew you were going to do <laughs> it. Didn't, I didn't know I was going to do it. So it is a great moment. The only thing I, I'll change in this entire episode is just the opening balls of the touch when he comes back would have been perfect. Yeah. A little taste. A little taste of that. Yeah. Dun, I, so, I mean, dun, dun, that song is great. Yes, I, was, I saw him live in uh, TF Nation in oh, 2017, nice. uh, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. Absolutely fantastic. Awesome. Was uh, Vincent DeCola there by any chance? Did they do a duet or anything? They did not, no. I've seen, I don't know if they're TF cons, but I've seen them do live collaborations before. Stan Bush. Oh, wow, that would be incredible. Like super- no, it was just, he, was, he was just Stan and his band. and That's uh, okay, was- that works. Right. <laughs> I still haven't seen stand at any of the tf cons yet no Mm -mm. i need to do that yeah i don't know if he's has he been to any since we've been going i that i don't know i i don't know i'm sure that there's people out there right now that are yelling at us screaming like yes yes or no there he hasn't (laughs) they're they're just yelling (laughs) they're so angry with us they're filled with the rage virus so that is the end of the episode. That's it. Prime is back. <laughs> we have some new characters and voice actors. Uh, we have Jessica Morgan, Mark Morgan, Greg Swafford, Bar- Bonnie Carlson, 
And I... I guess I didn't do the research. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know if they're alive or dead. I know that Bonnie Carlson is unknown. Uh huh. That was the uh, as, reporter. It's with most of the uh, one-off female characters, we don't know. We're going straight to Transformers TF Wiki, and we will credit Gregory Swafford is Jared Barclay, who was an American actor. Since 1940, he was on many films and TV shows, including Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Rawhide, Bonanza, and an acting coach. He appeared on Foofer, <laughs> Challenge of the Gobots, and he was also a travel photojournalist, but he died in 2022. Yep. So that's Gregory. Let's move on. Uh, Jessica Morgan is an unknown actor. Oh. As oh, well. That's right. unbelievable. Yeah, because she's in two episodes. That's weird. Yeah. Mark Morgan. Dr. Mark Morgan, please. He didn't go to uh, six years of animated doctor school to be called Mark. <laughs> Voiced by Aaron Kincaid, who we've covered mm -hmm. on the show uh, previously as Clementia. He does Skylinks, Alicons, uh, you know, pop in for a sweep every now and again. So that is... Uh, those are the new voice actors. We also introduce... The Throttle Bots. Uh, you have Chase, voiced by Robert Paulson. Not in his name is Robert Paulson. Not in this episode, but but who also did Air Raid, Freeway, Danny Mann also did Lightspeed and Dinosaur Neil. <laughs> not not in the Transformers. <laughs> Searchlight, Steve Bulin, who also did Strafe and was uh, the titular Crying Freeman. Wide Load was done by Corey Burton. Goldbug who hasn't shown up in this show yet. Mm -hmm. That's Dan Gilvezan and Rollbar did not appear in this episode. And we have a curtain call to Megatron. Yeah. As it's technically his last appearance in the American run. That's true. There That's it is. That's what I got. There it is. Poorly done. No, you did great. In the real world. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Episode number 208, Return of Optimus Prime, part one, aired, I was going to say September, uh, aired February 24th, 1987, in the American Top 40, number one for four weeks in February in Mar February and March of 1987 is Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi. This is the second chart-topping single from their third album, Slippery When Wet. It was written by- This album was unstoppable. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's it was everywhere. <laughs> Everything, all at once. It was written by John Bon Jovi, Richie Sambora, and Desmond Child. Of the song, Billboard said, Metal muscle meets gritty reality in a tough clangin' rocker. <laughs> it's a story song featuring two characters, Tommy and Gina, a working class couple struggling to make ends meet. Tommy loses his job as a dock worker due to a strike, while Gina goes to work as a diner waitress. The storyline was loosely based on real-life events that John Bon Jovi and songwriter Desmond Child experienced in the 1970s. Before becoming successful artists and songwriters, Desmond Child and his then-girlfriend, singer-songwriter Maria Vidal, lived together. They had already begun their music careers, but worked day jobs. Just like we work day jobs, but this is our passion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can't wait. We're going to be doing it in stadiums before. I can't yeah. wait until we go on tour and we get 200 more patrons so I can quit my job. Be nice. Is that, <laughs> is that how the math works? Uh, I figure we'd have to make a couple hundred thousand a year for me to quit my job and just do this full time. That'd be great. Yeah. That's the dream. Uh, Child was a taxi driver in New York while Vidal worked as a waitress in a diner named Once Upon a Stove, which is a great name. Uh, similar to Gina in the song. The owner, manager, and other employees of the diner nicknamed Vidal Gina due to her slight physical resemblance to Italian actress and photographer Gina Lolo... <laughs> Lilo, Lilo. Lolo Brigid... Br <laughs> Lolo Brigid... <laughs> Call in Julia. She yeah, needs please. to help us <laughs> with this pronunciation. Lolo Brigida. Can I see it? Yeah, it's... It's, it, it's either Lolo Brigida or Loyo Brigida. Thank you. Spaghetti. Um, <laughs> quote, it deals with the way that two kids, Tommy and Gina, face life struggles, noted Bon Jovi, and how their love and ambitions get them through the hard times. It's working class and it's real. 
I wanted to incorporate the movie element and tell a story about people I knew. So instead of doing what I did on Runaway, where the girl didn't have a name, I gave them names, which gave them an identity. Tommy and Gina aren't two specific people. They represent a lifestyle. Tommy and Gina are also referred to in Bon Jovi's 2000 single, It's My Life. In a 20- dip back into that well. I hate that song. <laughs> it's my life. That's all right. It's forgettable. Yeah. Uh, and in 2000- I think it was a big hit, but yeah. In a 2002 interview, Bon Jovi said that he wrote the song as a response to the Reagan era, adding, trickle-down economics are really inspirational to writing songs <laughs> <laughs> about how fucked up that shit was. Sure. Number one of the box office, also number one for four weeks in February, the top movie was Platoon, which reached number one in its seventh weekend after expanding from 214 to 590 theaters. It was the first film to gross more than $10 million on a weekend in February and Orion Pictures' biggest weekend. It was also the ninth biggest weekend gross of all time. Uh, Plat- have you guys seen Platoon? Yes, oh, yeah. many times. Super happy. <laughs> I like it. It's What's that director again? Oliver Stone. I don't like Oliver Stone's movies that much, but that one's one of the ones I... I, I agree. I, like. I prefer Born on the Fourth of July. Yeah, that's It's part one. of his like Vietnam trilogy. I can't remember the name of the third one. Um, I've Vietnam never s- really sucks, Oliver Stone. I don't really also like vi- Vietnam movies in general, uh, and I've never seen this movie. You never seen Platoon? No. Uh, have you ever seen Apocalypse Now? I have. Yeah, that's that's a Apocalypse Now. I it's enjoy. An in- it's a, yeah, it's an interesting one. James, have you seen Platoon? I I'm trying to think. I think I've seen bits of it, but I don't think I've sat down and watched it all the way through. I. Uh... Have you ever oh, seen God. Tropic Thunder? <laughs> yes, that I have seen. You, the ba- I mean, that kind of encapsulates all of that genre <laughs> of movie. That you know, I would assume that the Vietnam War does not uh, hold cultural sway in the UK as it does in the United States, right? The UK were they involved tan- even tangentially in the Vietnam War? Uh, as far as I'm aware, no. I mean, yeah. it wouldn't surprise me if somewhere behind the scenes, maybe, but on right. a very, very high level. But no, it, like it's, logistics or it, it doesn't have that same sort of cultural resonance. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we're aware of it. We obviously, it's, it's not. There are some conflicts around the world that the people outside of those countries don't know about. We, we're very aware of it, but it doesn't hold that same sort of significance. Right. It's America's greatest proxy war, <laughs> and it was a draw. We didn't lose at all. It was a tie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we just decided <laughs> to stop. <laughs> uh, Platoon was written and directed by Oliver Stone, as we said, and stars Tom Berenger, Willem Dafoe, Charlie Sheen, Keith David, and Kevin Dillon. The film was based on Stone's experience as a U.S. infantryman in the Vietnam War following a U.S. Army volunteer, Sheen, while his platoon sergeant and squad leader, Berenger and Dafoe, argue over the morality in the platoon and the war itself. Um, it received mostly positive reviews, though it was criticized as somewhat melodramatic and lacking honest emotion. Yeah. Vietnam vet and black journalist Wallace Terry criticized the African-American soldiers in the film, noting there were no black actors playing officers, and the three notable black soldiers were portrayed as cowards and stereotypes. Oliver Stone's kind of a weird guy. He's like He seems like a mouthpiece for the U.S. government in a weird way. But he what would find that slanderous because he's like a super conspiracy yeah like nut. an idiot yeah. i would say <laughs> i think he's a I, he did so much damage to like the the, the zeitgeist of america with jfk oh he, he thinks he's a lot smarter than he really i is. would agree with that yeah i, I saw him on jeopardy once and he was a, <laughs> he was fucking obnoxious <laughs> he sucked <laughs> Platoon won four Academy Awards, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Editing, and Best Sound, and as you may imagine, it did quite well at the box office, earning $138 million on a $6 million budget. So let's do some fun, fi- fun facts from this week in history. On this week's cover of TV Guide, we have Frank Sinatra and Tom Selleck, their partners in crime solving. I guess Sinatra was on an episode of Magnum P.I. Yeah. I don't remember that episode. Um... On February 20th, 1987, Unabomber Ted Kaczynski's 12th bomb went off in the parking lot of a Salt Lake City computer store and injured store owner Gary Wright when he attempted to remove the device, which looked just like a wooden box because Ted Kaczynski made all his stuff from scratch. Um, This was the bombing that led to that famous police sketch of the Unabomber that everyone makes fun of for looking nothing like him, but 
the real story behind that is the witness was super far away. Ted Kaczynski was in disguise, and this was nine years before he was caught. So it wasn't mm. a, it didn't look like him, but it was. There's a reason behind it. Mm. Uh, February twenty second, nineteen eighty seven. Andy Warhol, American pop artist and film producer, dies of a heart attack at the age of fifty eight. And this is topical because of the beginning of this episode. Uh, and in February 23rd, Supernova 1987A was observed in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a small satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, approximately 160,000 light years from Earth. It was the brightest supernova in centuries and the first one observed with the naked eye since 1604. Oh, wow. The shockwaves from the explosion can still be seen today. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, February. How long does a supernova take? I mean, is it in an instant or does it, is it over time? It happens, super- r- relatively speaking, it happens very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, yeah, it blasts off all of its, the energy, uh, right? its layers and Mass, that, that, yeah. that you can witness that for a um, long, a very long time. Okay. But it happens fairly quick. Like supernovas, like the, when you see the brightness and the dimness, yeah, it, it can happen. It's like, they're hard to. Sometimes they're hard to capture because they happen so quick. Yep. Yeah. They're very very cool. Um, Finally, February 24th, 1987, L.A. Lakers center Kareem Abdul-Jabbar scores his 36,000th NBA point in a 97-93 win over the Suns in Phoenix. Cool. And that is the real world. Great facts. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Finally, we have a new year to do facts from. (laughs) We had a new song with Bon Jovi. Mm -hmm. Bon Jovi. I never really loved Bon Jovi. I'm not. He's just not. He's not there. You're not down with the Jovi? With the Jove? He's not. He doesn't do it for me. I like him fine. Was Bon Jovi a thing in England? Did did anybody really care? Were you guys just listening to New Wave nonstop? Pet Shop Boys. No, but Bon Jovi is still very, very big. But not Bon Jovi, like three Bon Jovi songs, and that's it. Right, big right. in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Let's um, and that's about it. It's kind of All right. Here. He had international reach <laughs> from Jersey to the UK. <laughs> 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 and yeah, it wouldn't make much sense for the UK to help in Vietnam just because of the like where they're located. I Why think there were happen. some, for some reason, there was some, a little bit of Australian overlap. There were some Australian troops that were sent for some reason. I don't know. I'm sure there was a coalition of some sort. Yeah. Right. A heavy, heavy, uh, at one point there was a heavy French presence because it was. Oh, yeah. Was well, French. that's what started French it. French like, Yeah. The French in the 50s. Yeah. 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 Rip deviations. <laughs> In the original script, Optimus Prime is still damaged uh, in the the spacecraft, and um, the three of them fix him up before trying to reanimate him and send him off with the rage by uh, rage plague. I guess they just changed it for time, and maybe so it didn't look so gruesome. <laughs> um, the original glow of the spores was blue, which is weird because the spores were still red in the script, and I think a red glow is way better. Yeah. Blue to me Indicative is like... Indicative visually of, of uh, problems. Yeah, rage. Rage mm-hmm. equals red. I mean, blue to me would be like a lifesaver. Like... Right. <laughs> There's a scene where Rodimus dreams about encountering Optimus in the mausoleum and is chasing him as Optimus keeps fading into blackness, begging for Rodimus to help him. The Basically, the vestige of that we have is Rodimus saying he keeps dreaming about Optimus. Mm. Um, there are several cuts to Rodimus after he becomes infected in the original script, where he's ramming into te- taxi, cl- where he's ramming into taxi. Cl- ca- <laughs> Do you damn. need one of these? Where he is ramming into taxi. Cl- <laughs> <laughs> it's because what of the, the next, fuck? It's because of the next word I have to say. He's exclusively ramming into taxi cabs. That's how we'll phrase it. Um, and in one point, he picks up a taxi cab and throws it through a display window on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> Good uh, stuff. That's pretty much the only differences. We also have a 1987 toy. Why are they in New York City? I don't. I mean, they're all over. I don't know. Or I guess drove from maybe Autobot in, City is in is in the Pacific Cat's Northwest. Kills yeah, or something. Oh, I don't know. I don't have those figures. Um, we also have the 1987 Toy Fair promos for this season that I'll put up along with the full script uh, on the web page and the pa- and Patreon. But that's uh, that's pretty much all for script deviations. All right, well, it's time to rate the scheme. Uh, James, where are you with this one? Uh, it depends whose scheme. Yeah. I mean, Define the schemes. Well, I say, well, we've got the Decepticon scheme. Initial scheme is to steal the alloy, which right. they do. 
Yep. You've you just sit the, on it. The, yeah, they don't really do much with it. Off, well, <laughs> off as, you know, but then I suppose they all get infected and don't really have a chance to do whatever they were going right, to do with right. it. Um, you've got the Autobot scheme, which is to take back Optimus Prime's body, mm-hmm. which technically happens, mm-hmm. but not in the best circumstances. And then you've got the most successful scheme that backfires, which is <laughs> a scheme to infect all Transformers with the, or the majority of Transformers with the Rage Virus, right. which uh, does happen. Or the Rage Sports, right. sorry, I'm getting my 28 days later mixed up in this. <laughs> That's um, true. A successful <clears throat> scheme. Did it backfire, or is it exact? I mean, those guys well, knew organics would get infected. But did they think about it? Did they think yeah, about the consequences? No, not really. I mean, this is some, like, uh, I don't know, some some <laughs> MK Ultra level uh, not seeing the forest for the trees. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know if that metaphor completely works, but I'm going to They were never it. looking for the forest because they, they wanted this... They wanted to mess with this stuff from the beginning. I hate these Autobot trees. Aside from the Transformer uh, <laughs> connection that they ultimately made to, you know, wanting to use it to fuck yeah. over Autobots. Caleb? Yes. How do you feel about the scheme? <laughs> Sorry, you're not in trouble. He put the phone down thought, like he's was, his I child did, at I dinner. Did, I had to glance at something <laughs> real quick. Um, I'm going to give a scheme. Actually, no, I'm going to... New scheme? Yeah, uh, the scheme of the of the plague itself, I oh. think, is um, actually that's probably a ten. That's like <laughs> that's working really it well. Is, it spreads like the spores are wont yeah. to do. I'd say uh, that the uh, yeah the hate plague scheme is <laughs> top is notch. Top notch. I had to pull a bunch of mushrooms out that were growing out of my deck or, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they left a bunch of orange spores that were scary. Nice. And then I saw a squirrel eating a whole mushroom cap, and I'm like, Are you gonna die? Did it just, did it, and what? then it glowed red, and he tried to kill me. <laughs> I thought he just was out there, like, wandering around me, and like, whoa. Just, like, his eyes were just all black. <laughs> <laughs> just, it, because these are spores, does that mean there's sort of a mushroom-based origin for these things? What else produces spores? I guess it's just fungi, isn't it? Fungi, yeah. yeah. Why are they on a... Were they on that planetoid, or did they come from the sun itself? got to be the planet, well right? we'll find out in part two they shot him into the sun okay uh to try to destroy them but apparently they're pretty resilient there's a uh, there's a pretty good documentary it goes a little wooey woo but on netflix about fungi and like how uh interesting the super organisms on this planet are uh and uh taking mushrooms to uh help with a bunch of shit like end of life treatment and stuff right. like that right yep when are we going to record on mushrooms <laughs> we should do that during the yeah during between the seasons. Do it on the Joe episode. <laughs> That'll be so fucking boring if we recorded on mushrooms. <laughs> it's not a good idea. All right, so okay, we can. We can. I am the ghost of the iconic <laughs> You know, James, what stands out for you? Oh, I mean, it's, it, it's got to be the return of Optimus Prime, sure, we that, that is. What? No, it's the introduction of the Throttlebots. Yeah. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the Throttlebots. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's going to be Optimus Prime coming back. Um, I, I do, it always sticks out in my head as well, the the point where they find him on the ship. Mm-hmm. But it's, it, yeah, I think for me, it's got to be that, that moment that he returns and the touch doesn't play. The blinding, the blinding <laughs> light. Not about that at all. <laughs> the dark silhouette, yeah, coming from that's pretty I think, iconic. I think that's the obvious answer for me. I I kind of latched on to just um, I liked Crazy Ultra Magnus. I liked how focused he was <laughs> on taking out Rodimus and just being a lunatic. Yeah, I guess it's not iconic, but I really liked Rodimus being capable in this yeah. episode or trying mm-hmm. to be capable. His plans didn't really work, but. Um... But they were pretty solid. Yeah, he yeah. didn't fuck up. Yeah, really. Yeah. I mean, he let these simple humans trick him, but whatever. <laughs> we're taking it away from him right away. <laughs> okay. Caleb, you got anything else to add on that? <laughs> nah, I don't. I'm good. James, I... before we go on to the just to de- to preview the next episode and close out this one, closing thoughts on Return of Optimus Prime Part One. Anything you've missed or we've missed that you want to cover? Nothing I can think of. Great episode. Um, only gets better in part two. Just, just I, I do like, I do like how they. I, I like the fact it's two part and the fact they took their time setting this up. Um, like I said before, I think that that adds a lot of value to it, um, and it shows that it kind of feel it doesn't cheapen the fact that Rodimus 
will eventually um, lose his leadership because it, it doesn't just show him as being incompetent and then getting saved. It shows mm-hmm. him as a competent leader who is ultimately replaced by a competent leader, which I think that's is a good uh, point. actually quite a nice way of closing out. They could have made him the form guy in this. They could have made him an idiot and gone, oh, no, he's terrible. Um, the Autobots need saving, but they didn't. I don't like the fact that, that they played it the way they did. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. I, I would completely agree with that. Next time on the Autopod Decepticast. As season three strides to a sizzling finale, the hate plague's fiery fury flares, fostering fervent fights and fraught feelings. Will Prime die? <laughs> Find again? out next episode. <laughs> James, is there anything you'd like to plug before we wrap this up? Um, not really. No, I also have had a little chat about Good Sam. Um, mm-hmm. the, the 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 benefits of running on physical and mental health, I think, are the only thing I'd plug for anyone. But people, all, uh, I know a lot of people know this, but for anyone that doesn't, it's great. It does wonders. Excellent. It's not for everyone, but if you can, I yeah. recommend it. What if you hate running? Then do it anyway, and then you'll come to enjoy it. You hate running, don't you, Aaron? I don't love it. No, Mm, I don't. (laughs) My fellow Decepticons, give to me hurts! All right. Well, uh, hey, if uh, you'd like to help support the show, we invite you to check out our Patreon page that has many levels of support and uh, some amazing benefits you know, like like the booty box the legendary booty box at the five dollar level maybe you'll get it maybe you won't if, if, <laughs> you, we just sent them out qualified. recently people got no, them. Yeah. We, some people got them later than others <laughs> yeah. some had some, maybe we had some snafus in in transit it, or we, we fix forgetfulness it. we fix it though because that's that's who we are. The APTC problem. Look for it about every 16 months. <laughs> uh, you can also check out our wares at the APDC store. And uh, finally, you can buy us a drink. That's true. If you'd like to buy us a drink, you can just go to PayPal at APODDCast and send us five doll hairs, which I know Aaron loves that. And uh, tell, me what drink, on me. tell me what drink you'd like me to make, and I will make it on a future episode. Then there's also the if Apple you Oh, shit. Okay. Podcast, then your credit don't stink. Then reach inside your wallet now and buy us a drink. There it is. Really snuck up on me there. Every time. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> there we go. Sneaking up on Caleb. Play it again. <laughs> All right. And finally, there's uh, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play reviews that you can leave for us. As many stars as you feel appropriate based mm-hmm. on... Uh, how you feel five stars <laughs> please and you can find us on the social medias twitter facebook and instagram all of please, them please it's x a pod decast <laughs> you're right i hate it oh i fucking hate didn't it didn't you did somebody sign us up on the Caleb did. Uh, what is it called thread Ed? thread yeah we're on thread are we doing anything on thread i post the episodes any thread parties i, I just post the episodes Sweet. for now yeah all yeah. right we're on that thread and yeah. youtube yes yeah i forget about that i need to update my script but most importantly, our patrons can join that Discord mm-hmm. and we can hang out and chit chat whenever you want. Show notes, follow up materials, autopoddecepticast.com. We're done. That's it. Thanks for being with us, James. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Sponsor of Autopod Decepticast. Yes, 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 yes.